Final Fantasy VII has the biggest and most expensive story of the entire series. Final Fantasy XIV is catching up with its expansions, but VII is also still growing. The remake trilogy aims to retell parts of the original, but is fully its own unique narrative, acting very much, or almost, like a sequel than a retelling. Both newcomers and veterans have expressed feeling lost when examining these new games, and here we want to share the story of the entire compilation, including Before Crisis, Ever Crisis, Crisis Core, the original PlayStation 1 game, Deep Ground, On a Way to a Smile, The Kids Are Alright, A Turk Side Story, Advent Children, and Dirge of Cerberus. So you can be better prepared when playing the remake trilogy. The calendar in the world of Final Fantasy VII is divided by eras and can be confusing when talking about dates. With the recorded history that we know, the clearest moment that separates the two eras we'll be talking about is the end of the Wutai War. From the end of the war onward, the year goes from 2000 and resets to 1. We'll be going through the series in chronological order, but these dates should help anyone playing through the games and wondering where they're placed in the timeline. Before we start, there are some key items we'll have to go over to explain how the world of Seven works. The game takes place on the planet Gaia, where an ancient civilization lived called the Cetra. The Cetra were able to communicate with the planet through the livestream, and are linked with it at all times. The livestream exists in different forms and changes in appearance based on how it's interacted with. Every living thing contains this essence, and whenever something dies, its life and memories are sent back to the livestream in an endless cycle. The planet can use the spiritual energy to protect itself through various means and is something that you'll see a lot throughout the story. Leaks on the planet's surface can eventually form springs of the spiritual energy, crystallizing into orbs called materia. These orbs can give people the ability to use magic by calling upon the livestream to manipulate nature itself, increasing their own strength or other functions. They can also house creatures themselves, bringing them into the physical world as summons. While the livestream has many good properties, it also gives birth to monsters. Living creatures that are exposed to the spiritual energy can have their minds overflowing with the memories of those that died. This can cause all sorts of effects, most often leaving someone in a catatonic state. Prolonged exposure can change a creature entirely, however, morphing them into a monster. The distinction between a normal living creature and a monster is that a normal creature will kill to survive, but a monster will kill just to kill. Over time, many Cetra chose to abandon their connection to the livestream, creating the human race. While the civilization lived apart from each other, the Cetra would pass on legends of a sacred place, writing many of the discoveries the planet shared with them on tablets. With this knowledge, let's go back to roughly 2,000 years before the events of the first game. The Cetra lived prosperously, communicating with Gaia and being bestowed two gifts. One was a white materia, capable of protecting the planet by sending a message to cast a spell called Holy. The other was a black materia, capable of summoning the ultimate destructive magic known as Meteor. The Cetra kept these materia secret, choosing to hide the black materia while keeping the white materia close. One day, something from the sky crashed into the planet's north pole, creating a giant crater. The Cetra gathered around the nearby city called Null's Pole and began to speak with the planet about what had happened. Thousands of Cetra came to try to heal it, but it wouldn't do. The damage would have to be healed over years. The area froze over to repair the damage, and with the land becoming inhospitable, the planet told them to leave. Before they could, however, the Cetra were greeted by someone who looked familiar to them. A face they could recognize as their loved ones from the past. As they welcomed this being, the entity started to infect them one by one. This virus that was planted would drive them insane until they became monsters. They called the creature the Crisis from the Sky. This veiled creature went to each Cetral clan and infected them, prompting the planet to begin creating several weapons to deal with the threat. These creations of the planet were sentient biomechanical beings that would respond to anything dangerous enough to hurt Gaia. However, one was made as a last resort, a complete evacuation of all life on the planet, Omega. If it was ever needed, Omega would spawn chaos, an extension of itself to send as much life as possible into the livestream. Omega would then absorb the livestream of the planet and leave, rebirthing life someplace else. 
Fortunately, the weapons didn't have to step in as the few remaining Cetra managed to stop the creature, sealing the alien back inside the crater. The weapons fled underneath the planet's surface, encasing themselves in spiritual energy, and the Cetra did their best to move past the tragedy. Humans began outnumbering the Cetra and started setting up their own civilizations across the globe. As nations rose up and human technology advanced, the Cetra stayed to themselves, dwindling in numbers. Some humans would research the planet themselves and even uncover information about the Cetra ancestors that preceded them. They called these ancestors the Ancients and would eventually learn a lot of their terms from their writings. One company in particular took the Ancients' idea of the Promised Land literally and would spend time in search of it. This was the Shinra Manufacturing Works, a company focused on researching and making weapons. Over time, they would hire people to research the planet and its previous inhabitants. The leading expert of what would be called planetology, Bugenhagen, left Shinra and set up an observatory in a place called Cosmo Canyon, dedicating the area to anyone studying the planet. A race of nearly extinct, lion-like creatures guarded the area, performing rituals there every 50 years for the sake of the planet. Bugenhagen befriended them and was a witness to an ongoing feud between them and the Gi tribe. Two members of these red lion like species gave birth to a son named Nanaki, of whom Bugenhagen was treated as a grandfather to. Sedo, the father of the young cub, heard word of the Gi tribe trying to sneak up on them through a nearby cave. Wanting to protect his people, he made his partner and Bugenhagen keep the cave a secret. He went to the cave alone and killed them all, being hit with their petrifying darts in the process and becoming a statue. Sedo died and Bugenhagen sealed the cave caring for Nanaki, but never telling him what became of his father. Sometime later, in September of 1959, Shinra Manufacturing discovered the spiritual energy of the planet, calling the new energy source Mako. Using Mako, Shinra began to expand as new discoveries were made in how to use it. Electricity was able to be produced easily, but over time, Shinra began to use Mako to create new machines for construction and eventually as weapons. By 1968, the company created their first Mako reactor, siphoning the life stream from the planet in the small town of Nibelheim. Their mansion, Shinra Manor, in the same area, was used for keeping records of their findings and eventually their experiments. They found that the energy was plentiful, but the planet's surface lost its fertility and turned into a wasteland. Animals roaming around also run the risk of becoming monsters due to the Mako exposure, but even so, the Shinra company proceeded to move forward with a new development, the city of Midgar. Building reactor upon reactor, the new city was constructed by 1976 with a tall skyscraper in the center, serving as the new headquarters for the company called the Shinra Building. The building itself was built over Mako Reactor Zero and oversaw eight other reactors and sectors of the city. Sectors weren't the only thing that divided the city, however, with Midgar having plates that separated the people on top from the people living underneath. As the city became more and more populated, the Undercity, or the slums, opened up because of the overflowing number of people. It became a place for those who couldn't afford to live on top, with the plate above them serving as an artificial sky. The old abandoned houses for construction were then used as places to live. Any other housing was then made with the leftover materials or individuals buying new ones. Following the success of the city, Shinra, now at this point in time called the Shinra Electric Power Company, began researching the ancients heavily. This was in large part due to the legend of the Promised Land, of which they believed was a physical place with an unlimited supply of Mako underneath the surface. The following year, a leading scientist, Professor Gas Faramis, uncovered what he and his team believed to be the remains of an ancient at the North Crater. He named the creature Genova and began working with Professor Hojo and eventually Dr. Hollander to study her at the Shinra Manor in Nibelheim. Somewhere around the same time, Shinra funded Grimoire Valentine's research on the ancients and assigned the scientist Lucrezia Crescent to be his assistant. Together, they began to uncover the secrets of Omega and Chaos. After some time, President Shinra approved these three projects following Genova's discovery and assigned Lucrezia to assist Gast as well. Under the umbrella of what was called the Genova Project, Hojo and Hollander planned to use the creature's cells to birth another ancient. This would be in hopes of having the offspring show the company where the promised land was, leading the project to be split between the scientists. Hojo would lead Project S, while Hollander would lead Project G, 
Project Zero, better known as the Soldier Project, began development as well. This would infuse humans with some amount of Mako in order to strengthen their abilities. Soldiers' eyes would change as a result of the experiment, while the physical results varied from person to person. Shinra would use their investigation sector of the General Affairs Department agents, better known as the Turks, to track down potential candidates for soldier in between their regular duties, but many of their early experiments died in the process. At some point, Shinra also found the last of the ancients, a woman named Afalna, and kept her in captivity. It's presumably around this time that Shinra learned the name of the race of ancients, the Setra. After some time, Gas discovered that Genova was not a Setra at all, choosing to dedicate his research to learning about the real Setra. He resigned from Shinra and took Ifana with him to his lab in Icicle Inn, near the North Crater. Around this time, Grimoire found a secret crystal cave behind the waterfall near Nibelheim. There, he discovered a dark pool of the life stream, tainted but isolated and unmoving. He and Lucrezia determined that the pool was where chaos was meant to be spawned from. Inside the cave, they also found a unique materia having naturally formed over the course of thousands of years. Having been created by the planet itself, they called it the Proto-Materia and continued to test the effects of the tainted livestream in their lab. Unfortunately, part of the dark livestream escaped from its holding chamber and Grimoire died in Lucrezia's arms. Following this, the project was put on hold and Lucrezia and Hojo continued their research together on Project S. Grimoire's son, the Turk Vincent Valentine, would eventually be assigned to protect the scientists at Shinra Manor to Lucrezia's surprise. As the two grew close, she still blamed herself for his father's death and kept her involvement with him a secret. Vincent fell in love with Lucrezia, but while she may have had feelings for him, her guilt led her to pushing him away. Shortly after, she and Hojo became involved, and Vincent would tell himself that it was for the best. Under Project S, Hojo and Lucrezia determined that infusing Genova cells into a still-forming fetus was their best chance at reproducing an ancient. They ultimately decided to have the child themselves, but Vincent raised concern over using human test subjects. However, she told him that she was certain of herself, and so he let her continue her research. After some time, the results of the experiments were deemed a success, and Lucrezia gave birth to Sephiroth. Slightly before this, Hollander's Project G underwent the same process, conceiving two children with a fellow researcher. In those experiments, Gillian Hewley was implanted with Genova cells and gave birth to Angeal, while the other boy named Genesis had a different mother with Gillian's genes mapped onto him at birth. Although Project S was a success, Hollander's Project G was deemed a failure due to the fact that the children didn't inherit as many of Genova's abilities. As the result of the success, Hojo would get promoted as the director of Shinra's science department, while Hollander would get demoted to work elsewhere. Despite this, Shinra changed what was once their medical division for soldiers into a new experimental branch called Deep Ground. Under strict orders from the president, these experiments would be used in hope of creating an army stronger than soldier using G-cells and harsh training. In the village of Benora in the Maidil region, Shinra would begin to mine in hopes of planting another Mako reactor. In an attempt to conceal their operation, they had Shinra employees placed on the board of trustees to keep the town under surveillance. Gillian Hewley was sent to live there as well, and was offered money to keep quiet about her involvement with the Genova project, but she refused to take it. She and her partner raised Angeal, and she kept the details about his birth a secret from both of them. Genesis, on the other hand, was raised by a different set of parents who tracked his behavior for Shinra. After giving birth to Sephiroth, Lucrezia started to become so sick that she was unable to even hold her child. After hearing about this, Vincent confronted Hojo about her condition, angry over his disregard for her health. In response to this, Hojo shot Vincent and began to experiment on his dying body. He tried to change his biochemistry, both making him stronger while also giving his body the ability to transform, but failed. With Vincent's body being on the brink of life and death, Lucrezia tried to save him, doing whatever she could to stop him from dying. As a last resort, she used a tainted life stream, the essence of chaos itself, and infused it into Vincent's body. As his body began to change into a destructive monster, she placed the protomateria in his chest and ran away. Vincent was able to gain control over his body, but by the time he came to his senses, he was overcome with rage. He blamed himself for not stepping in to stop Lucrezia, and for her eventually getting sick. 
With her nowhere to be found, he decided to punish himself by locking himself inside a coffin in the manor where he would be tormented by his nightmares for years to come. During this time, Professor Gast and Ifalna started to grow closer. He would record many of their sessions together where he asked her questions about her heritage and about the planet. Through these sessions, he learned about the Cetra's ability to speak to the planet as well as heal it. He learned about the nature of the life stream, the weapons, and of the calamity that struck the planet nearly 2,000 years before. The two fell in love over time, and on February 7th of 1985, Ifalna gave birth to their daughter, Aerith. Gas was so enamored with her that he started to record her progress as well, taping him and Ifalna's time with their baby girl. On the 20th day after Eris's birth, Gas turned on the camera as usual, as his lab was raided by Shinra officers led by Hojo. He claimed that allowing him to leave with Ifalna was a ploy, knowing the two would one day give birth to a baby Cetra. He had the guards shoot the camera, take both Ifalna and Aerith, and murder Gast. While in captivity, Ifalna would eventually give the white materia passed down several generations of Cetra to Aerith, as the two would be regularly used for experiments. In the same year, Shinra started to increase the rate they siphoned Mako from the planet, turning the Undercity into even more of a wasteland. They planned to expand their reach in several other places, placing reactors in other regions. These were in Coral, Gongaga, Junon, and Fort Condor. One was planned to be constructed in the city of Modeoheim as well, but was abandoned halfway. The island nation of Wutai, however, refused to let them construct a reactor, leading to Shinra waging war against them. While Goro Kisaragi, the leader of Wutai, knew about Shinra's reach, Shinra still had several tricks up their sleeve. They began to make four huge materia in their reactors. These special materia were manufactured to have 330 times the power of normal materia and were used to generate high amounts of energy in the reactors. A Mako cannon called the Sister Ray was placed in Junon, powered by one huge materia placed inside the reactor they created on the water. Shinra had started a news broadcasting service around this time in order to spread their propaganda, stating that Wutai needed to be dealt with. More and more people would enlist in the Shinra army to fight, building their army even more. With the help of their soldiers, Shinra began deploying troops across Gaia to search for other places to place reactors. Throughout his time as head of the company, President Shinra had three sons, although only one of them was with his wife. Rufus Shinra was raised to be the next head of the company and would eventually start to harbor resentment towards his father after his mother passed away. Lazar Ducericus, the second son, would also harbor resentment toward the president. He grew up in the slums of the city with his mother and would eventually get a job at Shinra in hopes to one day get revenge on the president for ignoring her. As for the third son, well, we'll get to him at some point. Two security officers by the name of Glenn Lodbrock and Matt Windsor climbed through the ranks after being saved by a third officer named Lucia Lynn. By 1992, the three became soldiers themselves and were sent to the Rador Archipelago. The three were met with resistance from the Rador military, who were quickly dealt with when Sephiroth was deployed to the island. Sephiroth, having been raised by Hojo, behaved like a robot, following orders to the T and showed little interest in anything. Glenn and Sephiroth would butt heads and even bear witness to how cold Sephiroth was. Glenn tried to befriend him and show him that he doesn't have to act like a cyborg, even hugging him after Sephiroth slaughtered an entire camp, including the children. Back in Midgar around the same time, Ifalna managed to escape with Aerith from the Shindra building and fled to the Sector 5 slums. Elmira Gainsborough, who had been going to the Undercity station every day in hopes of being reunited with her husband coming home from the war, spotted the pair of Cetra and approached them. Unfortunately, Ifalna, injured from either the experiments or in the process of escaping, was dying. With her last words, she asked Elmira to take care of her daughter before dying on the steps. Elmira would raise Aerith as her own and start to recognize how special she was. Aerith would tell her that her husband had died and returned to the planet before Elmira received a letter confirming that he was killed in combat. The following year, the Turks found the Cetra's location and one of the agents named Song made a deal with Elmira that she would be able to raise Aerith as her mother, and if they learned anything about the promised land, they would tell the Turks right away. Somewhere around this time, Verdo, the chief of the Turks, was conducting a military bombing operation with Shinra. While he had tried to give the order to bomb an outpost 50 kilometers north of his home city Kalm, he and the other Shinra troops had their communications jammed. 
Due to miscommunication, Shinra bombed the city of Calm itself, and Verdot blamed himself for the deaths of his wife and daughter. While he ordered the remaining survivors to be taken to Nibelheim, Hojo had taken many of them to experiment on. Verdo's own daughter, Felicia, had survived the attack, but was kept in Hojo's lab where he tried to fuse materia with other creatures. Over a number of years, he eventually fused her with one half of a summoned materia for Zirconiad, an extremely powerful creature. Back in Benora, Genesis had grown up wealthy and became fascinated with two things. The story of Loveless, an unfinished play whose last act was searched for even by Shinra scientists, and the producer of a tree his family owned, Benora White Apples. They were called dumb apples, simply because they would grow at random times throughout the year. At some point, he entered a competition and won first prize for his idea of using the juice of the fruit to drink. Thanks to him, Benora started to make their main export Benora White Apple Juice. When interviewed after his discovery, Genesis was asked about his dream, saying that he wanted to share his dumb apples with his hero, Sephiroth. And Giel, meanwhile, didn't grow up with the same luxuries that Genesis did. His family was pretty poor, and even so, he lived being raised to value the simple things. He and Genesis became friends and rivals, and eventually joined Soldier. And Giel's father worked hard until he was able to get enough materials to have a sword made for him, one that would represent their family's honor. Sadly, shortly after this buster sword was created, he died. And Giel would sparingly use the sword after, in fear of tarnishing the blade his father worked so hard to make. On occasion, he would hold the sword to his forehead and talk with it as a means of reminding himself what he was fighting for. After a few years, Shinra lost interest in Benora, closed their mine, and removed their employees from the village. Back in Nibelheim, the townspeople would start to hear about Sephiroth, being described as a war hero. The children of the town would hear and share these stories, with one group in particular spending all their time with each other. Tifa Lockhart, along with her friends Emilo, Tyler, and Lester would play in town, but Tifa's neighbor, Cloud Strife, would only watch from afar. Cloud grew up very shy, wanting to join the other kids, but felt very separated from them. In 1995, Tifa's mother died after becoming sick. Tifa was eight years old and wouldn't accept her death, so she decided to climb the tallest mountain around, Mount Nibble, so she could see her mom in the sky. The other boys went with her, with Cloud following behind them. One by one, the boys left Tifa until it was just her and Cloud. While crossing the bridge, they both fell, leaving Cloud with some scrapes and bruises, but Tifa became comatose. The other boys blamed Cloud, telling Tifa's father that it was his fault that she climbed the mountain in the first place. Tifa woke up after a week, but Cloud never defended himself from the accusations. While Cloud hadn't had the best opinion of the boys before, he resented them even more after. He wanted to stand out, to be different, and hearing more about Sephiroth, he wondered if things would be different if he was stronger. Strong enough to have protected the girl he wanted to notice him. Tifa wouldn't be aware of anything that had happened, and continued life as normal, getting a kitten she named Fluffy for her 12th birthday years later. As Cloud continued to feel isolated, one day he worked up the courage to ask Tifa to meet him at the top of the village water tower. There, he told her about his ambitions, to join Soldier one day, and the two made a promise looking at the stars. That if Tifa was ever in danger, Cloud would come save her. At some point in the year 2000, Tifa would meet Richard Zengin training on Mount Nibble and become a pupil of his. She would start a calisthenics club at his request and earn money training other villagers. At some point, Richard would teach classes himself, all while giving Tifa his personal training books. Her father eventually made her some special equipment for fighting after she kept up her training. In the same year, Genesis, Angeal, and Sephiroth began to all train together. During a combat training exercise, simulated on the Mako Cannon in Junon, Genesis sought to prove he was worthy of being an equal to Sephiroth. Angeal intervened, injuring Genesis in the process. While it seemed like a normal injury at first, the wound didn't go away. Dr. Hollander explained that Genesis would need a blood transfusion to Angel and Sephiroth, but when Sephiroth tried to volunteer, Hollander refused. Despite his cold exterior, Sephiroth did grow close to the two of them, and had been upset that he couldn't help his friend. In actuality, Hollander told Genesis that his body was degrading and believed that he needed another Project G soldier cells to slow the process. Unfortunately, this didn't end up working, and the injury that Genesis sustained wouldn't heal. While looking for a way to slow the process down, 
Hollander discovered that the cells from Genesis were able to transmit his abilities over to other hosts. This ability to copy over a creature's structure meant that he could create an army of copies at his disposal. Hollander had already been mad at the company for taking him off the Genova project after Project G's failure, and the new discovery only worsened his thirst for revenge. He told Genesis that he could stop his body from degrading if he allied with him against the company, and out of desperation, he agreed. Lazard, who had risen through the ranks of Shinra to become Director of Soldier, also joined Hollander in secret and funded his scheme. He sent Genesis to a mission in Wutai where he and a large number of second- and third-class soldiers seemingly deserted. Sometime later, Genesis went to his home in Benora and killed nearly everyone in the village. He had his parents send false reports to Shinra HQ denying any sighting of Genesis, only to kill them after. Hollander deserted the company around the same time, stealing some of the Science Division's documents with him. He and Genesis set up a facility inside the Apple Juice factory and used the soldiers that followed them as the templates for their new army. While this was happening, Angeal was training a second-class soldier himself, an energetic recruit from Gongaga named Zack Fair. With the war still going on, Lazard needed a soldier to be sent to Wutai after the mass desertion, and so Angeal recommended Zack to go as his test to become first class. The mission was put into motion for Zack to serve as a distraction while Sephiroth was sent elsewhere. Zack took down Fort Tamblin almost entirely on his own, meeting Goro Kisaragi's daughter, Yuffie. He pretended to be no match for her might before she ran off with the hopes of one day freeing her people, something that she would continue to strive for. With his main mission complete, he and Angela returned to meet with Lazar just outside the fort. The three were ambushed by warriors in Wutai clothing, and Angel sent Zack to escape with the director as he dealt with the attackers on his own. By the time Zack returned, however, Angel was nowhere to be seen and he was forced to fight against a summon. Sephiroth came to deliver the final blow, but upon looking at the face of the Wutai warriors, he revealed to Zack that they were copies of Genesis. Sephiroth believed that with Angel missing, both he and Genesis were working together. Zack refused to believe this, and the two eventually returned home. Somewhere in the forest, Angeal did meet up with Genesis who told him the truth of their heritage. Angeal asked for time to think after learning about the circumstances of his birth. While he didn't agree with his friend's plan, he didn't feel like he could hold the same pride as a soldier either. After returning, Zack waited a month for Angeal to return. In that time span, Rufus Shinra became the official vice president of the company. After some time, agents were sent to Benora to question the validity of Genesis' parents' reports, but they never returned. Lazard initially was going to send Sephiroth to investigate, but he declined as he didn't want to be sent to potentially kill his friends. Lazard then decided to send Zack and Song to figure out what was happening. In the quiet village, they discovered graves of Genesis' parents, and Zack was tasked with checking to see if Angel's family was still there. He met with Jillian, who had heard tales about Zack and Angel already, and she told him that while Genesis killed everyone, she knew he couldn't kill her. She also told him the significance of the Buster Sword, explaining just how important the weapon was to Angel. Song and Zack eventually went to Benoraju's factory and found Genesis along with several tanks full of copies inside. Genesis incapacitated Song, but before he could attack Zack, Angel interrupted them, showing Genesis that while he wouldn't join him, he also wouldn't stand to see his comrade get hurt either. The two first classes ran off, and as Song got back up, he told Zack that Shinra had called an airstrike on the village. Rushing to the village to alert Jillian, Zack arrived too late, spotting Angel standing over his dead mother with the buster sword in his hands. Zack asked why he would kill his mother, and Angeal told him that neither her or her son could continue to live. Genesis distracted Zack as Angeal got away with another summon and decided to show him why they could no longer be considered soldiers. He sprouted a wing from his left shoulder and explained that he and Angeal are nothing but monsters before flying away. Zack escaped the village, watching as the airstrike destroyed Benora. In reality, this was done to eliminate the evidence of the copy technology. By February, the war with Wutai had ended, marking the start of a new era. Around the same time, a scientist by the name of Fujito had broken into the lab where Felicia was being kept and rescued her. He took her to Cosmo Canyon where Felicia came to, but with no memory of anything before. She would eventually go by Elf, and together with Fujito, they formed an anti-Shinra group called Avalanche, consisting of themselves and other planetologists from Cosmo Canyon. They moved their base of operations to Wutai and slowly made plans to stop Shinra's destruction on the planet. 
Somewhere along the way, Fujito managed to get the attention of Rufus Shinra. Rufus provided funding to their operations in exchange for them to kill his father, and became their man on the inside. Avalanche also recruited a man named Sears for help, and planned to bomb Reactor 8, only to be stopped by the Turks. The Turks at this time had a handful of new recruits using different weapons, all of whom had codenames based on what they used. Among them was a very young woman codenamed Shuriken, or Sisne. Because the Turk that is played for most of the missions in Before Crisis can be changed, we'll be referring to them as the Player Turk when recalling these events. While on patrol in Sector 8, the Player Turk happened to spot the Avalanche members trying to get to the reactor and attempted to stop them. Reno, another Turk, attempted to stop them as well and met the player at the site of the reactor. Sears stopped both of them, but was called to retreat to Junon where the president was holding a news conference. The two Turks followed suit and attempted to isolate President Shinra, but Fujito managed to still get to them. The player fought Fujito while Reno secured the president to a different location, but at the same time, Avalanche went after their real price and was making their way to the Sister Ray Mako Cannon's controls. When they discovered this, the president had Reno go to the cannon immediately, but as soon as he left, Fujito stepped into his safe room. He shot the president in the chest and left to assist the rest of his team, but the president survived the shot. He ordered Sephiroth to be sent out and the fight continued inside the cannon's facility. By the time the player Turk made it inside, however, the cannon had been turned off with a trail of bloody corpses leading to the controls. Elf fought the player Turk thinking they were the ones responsible, nearly killing them. Sephiroth then attacked her, sensing a strength within her body as they locked swords, but Elf managed to retreat. As a result of these events, the president ordered Soldier to try and deal with Avalanche, but this wouldn't last for long. The Turks got ordered to round up more candidates for the Soldier program in Costa del Sol. On the trip back to Midgar, however, one of the candidates ended up killing several of the others. He introduced himself as Azul, and while the Turks incapacitate him, they are attacked by Avalanche. The group ended up freeing the candidates before retreating, but Azul ended up returning to the ship. From there, he would enter Soldier and eventually Deep Ground. In this span of time, Zack is promoted to Soldier First Class, and both Angel and Genesis are declared as having been killed in action to the public. Lazard decided to let Zack and Sephiroth know at this point that Shinra had given orders to kill the rogue soldiers, but Zack wasn't trusted to carry those orders out. In the midst of their conversation, however, an army of Genesis copies began to attack the Shinra building. Several of them broke in, along with familiar weapons, leading Sephiroth to determine that Hollander was behind the attack. The two agreed to split up, and Zack headed to Sector 8 to ensure the people's safety. There, he met with the Turk, Sung, and introduced himself to the other Turks, Reno, Rude, and Sisney. Sisney had been assigned to watch over Zack from her superiors, but she quickly became fond of him. After some time, Sephiroth called Zack so they could get to Genesis and Hollander before the Shinra army, picking up on their trail to the doctor's lab in Reactor 5. On their way, they encountered a creature with Angel's face on it, showing that he too was able to copy himself. While Angel himself hadn't handed over his cells for this use, Hollander had already gotten his blood from before to do as he wanted with it. The two made their way to the doctor's lab and read Hollander's notes, learning about Project G and the cellular degradation of soldiers. Hollander came back after a while, and while Zack chased him out of the room, Genesis arrived and used the chance to talk with Sephiroth. He recited Loveless, asking what their roles would be in their play, saying that he could be the hero if Sephiroth hadn't taken all the glory. Although Sephiroth scoffed at him, Genesis clarified to his old friend that what he was looking for instead was the gift of the goddess, that is to say, salvation from his imminent demise. As Zack chased after Hollander, Angel stepped in between them. When asked what his goal is, Angel jokingly told Zack, world domination, sprouting a white wing from his right shoulder. Angel believed himself to be a monster, but Zack continued to argue with him, saying that he believed he had Angel's wings. In response, Angel placed his buster sword into the ground and told Zack, Angel's dreamt of one thing, to be human. He attacked him, and the shock wave sent Zack falling down to the Sector 5 slums. There, he woke up to Aerith, who had been attending to the flowers inside the church before Zack had crashed through the ceiling. The two flirted with each other, and eventually, she agreed to show him the way out of the slums. While they walked, she told him that she had a fear of the natural sky. In response, he promised her to take her above to show her the real sky to prove it isn't so frightening. 
Before leaving, some kids stole his wallet, and Zack saw firsthand just how hard it is living in the slums. He helped them out in exchange for his wallet, and afterwards, the two went shopping, where he learned of Eris's love for flowers and her desire to sell them to people. He bought her a ribbon and promised to come back to build a wagon for her to sell her flowers from. Before they went their separate ways, she confided in him that she was scared of soldiers, the men who loved fighting and would undergo a special process just to obtain power. In trying to show her that they weren't all like that, he showed her his eyes and explained that he was a soldier himself. As she admired his eyes, he said that they were the color of the sky, except she wasn't afraid of them. At that moment, he received a call telling him to return to the Shinra building urgently. On the way, Angel flew down to him, telling him about his state of mind. While he felt confused at times, he resolved to regain his honor. They agreed to work together to stop Genesis and Hollander, and Angel flew Zack to the Shinra building and met with Sephiroth. Because Hollander seemed to be the mastermind behind everything, they determined that Hojo would be the next target. While Sephiroth stayed to deal with the other Genesis copies, Zack, Angel, and Genesis all met in Hojo's lab. There, Genesis once again recited Loveless, posing the question of what the gift of the goddess was to monsters like him and Angel. After destroying one of Hojo's experiments, he flew through the hole in the wall he created. Angel carried Zack to follow him, but Genesis had another summon that Zack was forced to fight. By the time he defeated the summon, however, both Angel and Genesis were gone. Zack returned to HQ and waited as Shinra continued to search for traces of Genesis and Hollander. During his wait, Cloud, now enlisted in the Shinra army as an infantryman, began to work as escorts for certain missions. He and the player Turk were tasked with escorting a scientist carrying classified soldier documents named Dr. Rayleigh. Avalanche, who had been looking to steal these classified documents, ambushed the group on a train. Cloud was quick to step up in an attempt to prove that he could one day be a soldier himself. However, some of the Avalanche members were very different from normal. Fujito had changed them into what he called the Ravens, men equipped with superhuman abilities not unlike soldier. While Cloud and the player Turk managed to defeat them on board the train, they left the Doctor so that they could fend off the incoming forces outside. One of the Ravens, thought to be dead, managed to steal the documents and escape, showing how rapidly they were able to regenerate. Cloud had proven he could hold his own and defended the Doctor, but the player Turk was still punished for letting the documents fall into enemy hands. Avalanche then focused their attention on Hojo, as they wanted his expertise after having created the perfect soldier Sephiroth. After a few months, Zack continued to struggle in putting everything together and tried to get a hold of Sephiroth, but the man locked himself inside the data room of the Shinra building, researching the history of the science department. He went to visit Aerith instead, after she reminded him of his promise to make the wagon, and met Angel on the way. He informed him that while he wasn't part of Soldier, he still wanted to uphold his responsibility to them, letting Zack and Lazard know that he had tracked down Genesis and Hollander in Modeoheim. While Zack tried to visit Aerith before leaving, Song arrived to pick him up before he could. Their helicopter ended up crashing, however, and they ended up being forced to walk the rest of the way. On their way, Zack talked to Cloud, who happened to be one of the infantrymen sent on the mission, and bonded over the fact that they were country boys. Cloud opened up to Zack and stated how he wanted to join Soldier too. He gave the new recruit some words of encouragement, and they eventually arrived at their destination. Genesis and Hollander had set up their base of operations inside the abandoned reactor of the town, but the now noticeably deteriorated Genesis had been tired of being strung along. He threatened the doctor just as Zack and Cloud entered the scene, and the two split off from one another to deal with the pair. Zack was forced to fight Genesis, as the man declared that if he could not be saved, he would at least try to take everyone down with him. Nevertheless, Zack defeated him and Genesis recited his play again, walked toward the ledge, and fell into the abyss. Zack then chased after Cloud, but found both him and Song collapsed on the ground. Song told him it was Angel that fought them, and as Zack confronted his former mentor along with Dr. Hollander, he learned the truth about everything. Hollander explains that Angel was the success of the G project, able to not only copy his abilities over to others, but also call back to them, an ability that Genova herself possessed. Angel revealed to Zack that he hadn't killed Jillian, but it was she who took her own life. Wanting to end the bloodshed in Hollander's means of creating monsters, Angel called upon the creatures he imposed his cells on and had them merge with his body. 
Zack's face was scarred as his old friend attacked him and was ultimately forced to kill the monstrosity that Angeal had become. Angeal handed him the Buster Sword as thanks for freeing him and told him to use it to protect his honor. In the aftermath, Hollander was imprisoned and Zack grieved for his former mentor at Eris' church. Shinra's efforts in suppressing Genesis seemingly ended, but they were still in the middle of dealing with Avalanche. During a meeting, Rufus Shinra would bring up how suspicious it was for Avalanche to always be where the Turks were, hinting at the possibility of them all. This led to Verdo splitting the Turks up to cover more ground as they searched for Avalanche. After hearing of the two soldiers by the name of Esse and Sebastian being taken from an outpost in Icicle Inn, the player Turks sprung into action. The entire outpost was destroyed by two ravens, and Song determined that Avalanche must have had a base nearby. They investigated the disturbance there, and discovered an avalanche facility where the soldiers were held captive. Inside, they were encased in pods of liquid along with other avalanche members, undergoing a similar process that soldiers would go through. The player Turk freed them and escaped with the help of another Turk, but Fujito met them outside with his ravens. He explained that using his equipment allowed him to make his followers immortal, giving the Turks no chance at winning. Luckily, a newly recruited Turk managed to come in to save them and retreat. They returned to a hidden base nearby and reported their findings to Verdot. After being briefed on Avalanche's actions, President Shinra ordered that Sephiroth be sent to destroy the base. Sephiroth, however, had already been sent to another mission, and so the President asked that Zack be sent instead. Two days later, Zack and the other members of the Shinra military arrived at the scene, already familiar with the other soldiers. As the mission went on the way, however, Zack and the player Turk were separated from the rest of the troops. By the time they had caught up with them, Fujito and his ravens had ambushed the group and taken Essay and Sebastian again. Verdo was more convinced of them all in the group at this point, but the mission stayed the same and Zack and the player Turk continued. They reached the facility and found the soldiers in the same pods again, changed into ravens. Zack tried to reach the humanity inside them, and while they fought against their urge to kill him, they both collapsed and died at his feet. Avalanche had then set their facility to blow up, forcing Zack and the player Turk to escape. With the mission over, Zack placed his friend's swords over a grave and said goodbye one last time. Because the entire mission had so many flaws, President Shinra ordered that Verdo be demoted, leaving the Turks in disarray. By the following month, Heidegger, the director of the military, replaced Verdo. He sent the Turks to patrol Junon, where they happened to stumble across Avalanche members after the airships in the city. As Heidegger learned of the situation, he waited for the Turks to be overrun as an excuse to send his military troops to the scene. Song realized this could cause heavy damage to the city, but Heidegger pushed the agenda anyway. After seeing how careless Heidegger was being, Verdo marched to the president and blackmailed him into giving him back his position. The president had no choice but to reinstate him, and Verdo coordinated the mission successfully and called in a new recruit to help. While the president was pleased with the results, they still had no idea who the mole was and shifted their suspicions to Hojo. In the months to follow, Zack took on the duties of his former mentor and became the leader of many of the new recruits. He made an effort to tell Cloud in particular to keep aiming for his dream. As he addressed the troops, he held the blade to his forehead, like Angeal before him, and gave them the same advice he received from his friend, embrace your dreams and protect your soldier honor. With Hollander arrested, Lazard left Shinra knowing it would only be a matter of time until his involvement was investigated. Eventually, Zack was sent to Costa del Sol on a forced vacation, but would continue to be watched by the Turks. Shinra was dealt a heavy blow, and with word of both Angel and Genesis becoming taboo, Zack wondered what he was fighting for to begin with. He would regularly call Aerith, and one day, Cisne decided to let Zack know that they were doing surveillance on her, that Aerith was the last ancient in the world. They suddenly were attacked by Genesis copies, and learned that they were attacking several different locations at the same time. As the Genesis copies were reported to be in Junon, Zack and the Turks moved there in fear of Hollander being broken out. Zack spotted the doctor attempting to escape, but ran into several obstacles, leading to his eventual escape. As Sephiroth entered the scene, he explained that several Genesis copies were sighted at other reactors. This had all been in search of Genova cells, as Genesis had come to the conclusion that there were his only hopes at stopping his body from degrading. Sometime after, Avalanche released several monsters in Midgar in an attempt to distract everyone. As the Turks evacuated the building, Fujito and Sears snuck into the Shinra building and attempted to kidnap Professor Hojo. 
The Turks caught on to this and attempted to chase them, even as they rode away in the helicopter, but had trouble catching up. During their escape, Fujito and Hojo got along fine and started to talk about Elf more like an object of research than a person. This would make Sears uncomfortable and eventually sow seeds of doubt in Fujito's motives. On the Midgar Highway, the Turks eventually came across one of Hojo's experiments, a green dragon. While the monster was too strong for the player Turk to deal with, Sephiroth came in to slice it in half before bringing the helicopter down too. Hojo was saved, but Fujito and Sears got away without any issue. Back at their headquarters, Elf lectured Fujito over his actions while their informant told them of a powerful asset they could try to get on their side, an ancient. Two months later, the player Turk ran into Aerith coincidentally after getting lost in a Sector 5 slum just as Avalanche members arrived. They defended Aerith, not knowing who she was, and hid with her. Aerith began to trust them as they ran and asked about life outside of Midgar. The player Turk told her all about her time in other cities, but after some time, Aerith realized she lost her materia. The player Turk offered to get it back for her, but Sears found them first. He knocked out the Turk and ran to the church with Aerith under the assumption he was saving her. As the player Turk caught up, Elf apologized to Aerith for the misunderstanding and asked for her cooperation in taking Shinra down. By telling her where the Promised Land was, Elf hoped to protect it from Shinra. The player Turk overheard the conversation and started to question her superior's intentions as Aerith explained that even as an ancient, she had no idea where the Promised Land was. As the Avalanche members settled on this information, Aerith began to hear a voice inside Elf, one crying in pain. As Fujito tried to interrupt this, they discovered the Player Turk's presence. After a long fight, Avalanche defeated the Player Turk, but decided to leave Aerith alone with their offer to join them still standing. As the Player Turk came to, they told Aerith that she should leave, to run away and see the world like she's always wanted to, but Aerith rejected the idea. Someone had to take care of the flowers after all. As they walked out of the church, the player Turk noticed Song and asked for Aerith to run away as she held him off, but Song explained to the player Turk that he wasn't after Aerith the way they thought he was. The deal was still in place, and he and the other Turks acted as watchful guardians. Over the coming weeks, Shinra received word that all of their workers in Nibelheim had gone missing, prompting an investigation by the Turks. Aerith would find her materia again sometime after, but eventually she'd be visited by a canine-like creature with one wing bigger than the other. Zack would make his way to visit Aerith like normal and run into the beast inside. It revealed itself to be made from Angeal's cells, another copy, and defended the two of them from machines that were after them. Zack and the creature shared a mutual understanding, though he was still hesitant of its intentions. Even so, he left to gather materials so he could make the flower wagon he promised her and run into more machines. Upon defeating them, Song arrived and explained that the robots were intended to get rid of the Genesis copies and were nearly done before leaving. Zack returned with the materials and finally built the wagon but received a call from Sephiroth asking him to return to the Shinra building. There, he explained to Zack the updated situation in Nibelheim. Monsters affected by the Mako had been proving to be a problem for the town, and all the workers at the reactor had gone missing. Additionally, soldier operatives that were tracking down Lazard's whereabouts were nowhere to be found. Hollander's spot seemed to have been seen there as well, linking him, Lazard, and Genesis all together. He warned Zack that their official mission had only been to investigate the reactor, but depending on what happened with Genesis, he might abandon Shinra in pursuit of his friend. Before leaving for his mission, Zack returned to Aerith to sell flowers, knowing he wouldn't be back for some time again. Song reassured him that he would protect her, and laughed in amusement at how much the men cared for the ancient. On September 21st, the Turks arrived at Nibelheim before anyone else to investigate the reactor, but as the player Turk parachuted down, a gust of wind sent them off course. They landed near the peak of Mount Nibble, coincidentally as Tifa was out chasing her cat Fluffy, leading her up the mountain as well. As Tifa climbed upward and the Turk climbed downward, the two met just as the young girl found herself surrounded by monsters. The Turk saved her and agreed to help escort her back to her village after they were done with her mission. Unfortunately, the Nibelheim reactor had a swarm of green dragons around it, forcing the Turk to retreat. After reporting back to Tsong about the unbelievable situation, he instructed the player Turk to go back to town and await further instructions. As they returned back in a ropeway car, the two began to talk and Tifa asked the Turk if they knew anyone named Cloud. 
She explained the promise she made with her childhood friend before he left with the dream to become a soldier just two years prior. The player Turk recalled having worked with a cloud at some point, but wasn't sure if the two were the same. Suddenly, one of the dragons destroyed the rope of the car and the two were forced to jump. They landed on the ledge near the mountain, but the green dragon followed them. The player Turk saw it moving toward the rope bridge leading to the reactor and confronted the monster before it could break it apart. Upon reporting to Tsung, they learned that a team led by Sephiroth was being deployed and would be arriving soon. Unable to get in contact with Verdo, Tsung requested that the Turk find a guide for Sephiroth's group due to the rope race collapse. Luckily, they knew exactly the person for the job. The next day, Zack, Cloud, and Sephiroth set off for Nibelheim along with two other Shinra officers. The player Turk met with them as well and promised to keep Cloud's arrival a secret from Tifa as he hadn't become a soldier yet and everyone readied themselves for the mission. Zack met Tifa as well, who asked if there was any more than just the two soldiers there, wondering where Cloud was. The young man kept himself hidden but still made the effort to visit his mother. They slept for the night and in the morning, the group ventured out while Cloud hid his face underneath his helmet. Even though they had some trouble along the way with the rope bridge collapsing, the group managed to make their way to the reactor. Once there, the pair of soldiers had Tifa and Cloud wait outside. Both Sephiroth and Zag fixed the leak inside, but in doing so, they saw the remains of human experiments infused with Mako. While Sephiroth explained that what they were seeing were monsters, Zag posed the question of how soldiers were different. This weighed down on Sephiroth's mind, making him wonder if he was created in the same manner if he was a monster. Genesis appeared and knocked Zack on the floor as he told Sephiroth that he was a product of the Genova project just like him. Genesis hoped his old friend could give him his cells and explained that unlike him and Angeal, Sephiroth wasn't prone to degrading. Sephiroth declined, however, and told Genesis that whether he was lying or not, he would not help him save his life. The two left, but as Zack chased after Genesis, he found Cloud and Tifa being attacked by monsters. Cloud tried protecting Tifa, but was injured in the process. Zack took care of the creatures and took the pair back to town, but they were unable to find Sephiroth. As Cloud and Zack returned to the room they were staying in, Zack felt uneasy, unable to figure out just what he was fighting for. He held the Buster Sword to his forehead to calm down and remembered what Angeal had taught him. He made the time to talk to Aerith, whose flower wagon wheels had broken, and promised to see her when he got back. He then went to visit Sephiroth, who everyone had seen go to the basement of the Shinra Manor. There, Sephiroth began to obsessively research everything about the Genova project, the Ancients, and his creation. Under the assumption that Genova was an Ancient, etc., Sephiroth believed that humanity had betrayed him. To him, Genova was his mother, and he, he was the product of a society that had abandoned his people. On October 1st, he set fire to Nibelheim in a fit of calm rage and killed everyone that stood in his way. Cloud wound up on the floor and lay helpless as he watched his mother's home burn to the ground. Zack arrived in shock at the scene and chased after Sephiroth, but Brian Lockhart, Tifa's father, had already been on his tail. Sephiroth returned to the reactor and Tifa followed her father not far behind, but by the time she made it, her father was already dead. Sephiroth's sword lay next to him and she attempted to take it and go after him, but he overpowered her. The player Turk followed as well, but wound up being defeated. Zack caught up as Sephiroth opened the door to Genova's chamber where the alien creature had been kept all this time. While he tried to stop him, Sephiroth was too powerful and sent him flying down the stairs. Cloud arrived moments after, took the buster sword from the floor and impaled Sephiroth. As he returned to check on Tifa, Sephiroth took Genova's head from her body and approached the collapsed group. As Zack became to come to, he told Cloud to finish the job. He rushed to attack Sephiroth, but he stabbed Cloud in the chest despite being wounded. While it looked like he won, Cloud managed to shift things around and swung Sephiroth with the blade still in his chest. He sent the soldier flying with his mother's head in his hands, and Sephiroth fell down in the reactor. Cloud collapsed from his injuries, along with Zack and Zengen showed after being led by Fluffy to retrieve Tifa. With Shinra's most famous soldier massacring the town, the Turks were instructed to bring Hojo with them as they planned to cover things up. Seeing the two men that survived Sephiroth's onslaught, Hojo decided to use Zack and Cloud as test subjects. With Sephiroth dead, he hoped to recreate him and would continue to try to create copies of the man. As they were experimented on, Tifa was taken to a clinic for her injuries, and the Turks were instructed to remove the evidence. 
As they were removing evidence over the course of a few weeks, Verdot and the player Turk found themselves in the basement of the Shinra Manor. There, many of Hojo's experiments called Lost Number created an illusion. The player Turk's memories of their first mission played out, but when the illusion shifted onto Verdot's memories, they revisited the events of the bombing of Calm. Once they escaped the illusion, Verdot told the player Turk that no matter how tragic the incident, their job took priority. Just like in Calm, they would do the same to Nibelheim. Verdot buried himself in work to overcome the trauma, but the player Turk was already having regrets. Following this, the Turks identified that Avalanche's base was in Wutai and discovered Rufus was the informant. In the following months, the player Turk was sent to Wutai where they met Yuffie. Seeing how strong the Turk was with Materia, Yuffie vowed to use them one day to get back at Shinra. While the plan was to send the player Turk in secret to plant explosives, Yuffie got in the way and stole the detonator. The explosive still went off, however, the Turk was still inside and was forced to fight Avalanche leaders before escaping. This was all part of Avalanche's plan, however. Rufus was well aware that he was being watched and fooled Shinra into thinking they got rid of the group once and for all. The president then shifted his focus to a space program for the next few months. In Rocket Town, Sid Highwind had been leading the launch for Shinra No. 26 in high hopes. The launch was going to be televised, making it the perfect time for Avalanche to come out of hiding again to disrupt it. They stole an oxygen tank just before the scheduled launch. His friend Shira had gone to replace it, but with no time, Sid was forced to abort the entire thing. Shinra's public image had been tarnished after the failed launch, so they put the entire space program on hold. Sid would personally hold this against Shira, and Avalanche shifted their focus to the reactors. The following months, Avalanche set their sights on the reactor being built on Mount Corel. A miner at the Corel village named Barrett Wallace was working his shift when both Avalanche and the Turks came through. He'd hoped that the construction of the reactor would be good for the economy, but would argue with his friend Dine over it. Barrett's priority was to provide for his wife, Mirna, who had been sick for some time, and so when the Turks came in to stop Avalanche, he was more than happy to show the player Turk the way to the reactor. As the Turks made their way inside, they encountered Rufus already waiting for them. As Verdot made his way there as well, he revealed Rufus as the informant. Under orders from the president, he was to be placed under house arrest. The vice president replied by scoffing at them as Fujito and more avalanche members stared at them from above. Unfortunately for Rufus, Fujito double-crossed him and sent his men in to kill both him and the Turks. While defending themselves, Elf reported back in and Verdot immediately recognized her voice. As the memories came flooding back to her, she became overwhelmed and ran away. The Turks all urged Verdot to chase after her, to reunite with Felicia and abandon his position. As he did, the rest of the Turks left the reactor with Rufus before the explosion, but the player Turk was forced to stay behind. They teamed up with Sears, who chose to abandon Avalanche after hearing all of Fujito's plans. Using Elf as materia, Fujito planned to kill everyone in the name of preserving the livestream. He handed the player Turk a special materia, but as they made their escape, a gap in the bridge stood in their way. Sears pushed the player Turk out and stayed behind as the reactor blew up. In the aftermath of the explosion, they sustained multiple injuries and the president kept Rufus's involvement with Avalanche a secret within the Turks and kept Rufus confined within the Shinra building. Rufus still told the president what had happened with Verdot, however, making President Shinra give Song the role of chief. As his first mission, he was instructed to track down his former superior and kill him. The Turks had backed away from their involvement with Corel, and Shinra burnt Corel village to the ground as both Barrett and his best friend Dine were away. On their way back, they managed to catch them in the act, but before they could run in to save their families, Scarlet, the director of Shinra's weapons division, led her troops after them. As the troops shot them, Dine slipped off the mountain and held onto Barrett's arm. As he dangled from his grip, Scarlet had her men shoot their linked arms, severing them. Dine fell off the mountain, nowhere to be seen, but Barrett managed to eventually get away. In his guilt for what had happened, Barrett searched for survivors, but was shunned by the majority of them. He replaced his lost arm with a machine gun through a surgery a while after, and eventually found Marlene, Dine's daughter. To make it up to his dead friend, Barrett decided to raise her as his own. In the years to follow, the village was replaced by the tourist attraction called the Gold Saucer. Gongaga's Mako reactor suffered a similar fate, although the exact cause was unknown. Its people then chose to live without Mako after the catastrophe. 
Tifa would eventually find work in Midgar as a bartender for a place called Seventh Heaven after moving to the Sector 7 slums. That brings us to the year 6, six years after the Wutai War. The player Turk woke up from their injuries and Mako poisoning after three years. They were greeted by their comrades who informed them that Avalanche had been silent since the explosion. Verdo continued to be missing and normal operations had been running ever since. Their first assignment back had them sent on a mission to capture a tiger-like endangered species for Hojo in Cosmo Canyon. Nanaki was in the middle of performing a sacred ritual for the planet as the Turks showed up. There, the player Turk met Bugenhagen who informed them that Verdo had been there as well. Bugenhagen told them about the powerful summon that Elf possessed that was absorbing her life and that for Furhito's plan to succeed, he would need more of the special materia. Verdo had been looking for a way to remove the materia from her before it could kill her, but the Turks still had to finish their job. Avalanche had arrived and Fujito forced Bugenhagen to tell him how the summoning worked by threatening to kill Nanaki. The Turks defended them, but they were forced to take Nanaki regardless. They decided to allow him and his companion Dine to finish their ritual. Two months later in December, Zack finally awoke from his pod inside Hojo's experimentation room. He freed Cloud, who was still recovering from the effects of the Mako, and made his escape. As he traveled through Nibelheim, the entire town had been rebuilt. The Shinra army met him and refused to let him escape. Zack had no choice but to fight and eventually ran to Shinra Manor, putting Cloud in a first-class soldier outfit. As he did, he remembered his promise to Aerith and decided to bring him with him. With both of them on the run, the Turks are ordered to track down the escapees. While this mission could be played by any player Turks in Before Crisis, we know from Crisis Core that Sisney is the one who successfully tracked them down. Having already had her doubts about Shinra and caring deeply for Zack, she let him go. From there, the player Turk went to investigate Shinra Manor where they encountered Verdo. They help him in his attempt to find a way to save Elf, and even find Vincent, who points them in the right direction. They acquired another special materia, but Fujito arrived just in time to steal it from Verdo. As everyone went their separate ways, Verdo made sure to have the player Turk ask Reef Tutsi about where to find the other materia. The Shinra army had been watching, however, and Scarlet reported to the president that the Turks had been working with Verdo. The Turks stood their ground and decided to all simultaneously betray the company in order to help Verdo. They were aware that the army would be against them, but they continued to operate, knowing that the president wouldn't touch them as long as they had Rufus. They met with Ketseth, a cat-like machine under the control of Reeve, and had him infiltrate the Gongaga reactor. There, the player Turk is rescued by Sears, who is accompanied by Verdo. They explain that Verdo saved him and have been working together as rogue agents in search of any way to help Elf. After acquiring the materia, they all meet outside and go over their options. While gathering the materia would free Elf, it would also summon Zirconiad. They come to the conclusion that while Zirconiad can be summoned when four of what he called support materia are gathered, it wouldn't be as strong. In his weakened state, they could summon and kill it before it did any damage. As they left Gongaga, President Shinra settled on wiping out the Turks entirely and had the military officially go after them. As the Turks searched for the remaining materia, Zack made his way to Gongaga himself. On the way, he ran into Genesis, who took his hair and had one of his copies eat it to see if it was his gift of the goddess. While the copy transformed, it didn't give him the expected results. Once he arrived in Gongaga, he left Cloud as he ran to visit his parents. Sisne was already there and told him not to worry about his parents and that Angeal had been seen nearby. As he chased what looked like his former mentor, he ran into both Genesis and a winged Hollander who had injected himself with G-cells to survive. They explained that they were after the S-cells that were in him and Cloud in hopes that it would cure the degradation. Zack fought the escaping Hollander and killed him before he could do any more damage to the world. As he and Angel reunited, the men explained that he wasn't actually who he thought he was. It was Lazard who explained everything he had done up to that point. Oddly enough though, once he became an Angel copy, his lust for revenge faded away as though Angel's own ambitions were transferred over. Instead, he aimed to help Zack and find a way to save Genesis. They agreed to try to save him, and Zack was able to discover where Genesis had been hiding the entire time. With his apple always in hand, he could only be in Benora. As he left Lazar to protect Cloud, Zack ventured into the Benora mine, even finding all of Genesis' prized possessions from when he was a child. There he ventured into the cave and gathered what was called the Goddess Materia in order to open a door inside. On the other side, he found Genesis by an ancient statue reciting Loveless. 
With Zack having inherited Angel's will through the Buster Sword and carrying Sephiroth's cells in his body from Hojo, the play had all of its characters. Genesis then enveloped himself in a livestream emerging from below the statue and transformed into a new being. Zack fought the new Genesis avatar and defeated him, but after Genesis returned to normal, his body had no signs of degrading. While he had finally been purified, he had hoped to still regain his soldier honor and challenge Zack to a duel as warriors. The pair clashed swords again, and in his defeat, Genesis found himself inside the livestream. He was face to face with what he believed to be the goddess herself. This being was named Minerva, and while Genesis had finally embraced death, when he came to joining the livestream, Minerva shook her head at him. Zack then took him over to Cloud and Lazard, who had just finished fighting off Shinra with the help of the canine beast from years before. As both Lazard and the beast rested on the verge of death, Zack began to cry for them. After he placed an apple in the hands of Cloud, Genesis, and himself, he began to eat it. Finally, after so many years, Genesis had his dream of sharing an apple with a hero come true. Both angel copies returned to the livestream, but Zack noticed that the dog had been carrying something. The final letter that Aerith had been writing to Zack for the past four years. As it dawned on him how much time had passed, he picked up Cloud and headed for Midgar, taking one last look at the now-cured Genesis. After he left, however, Genesis was picked up by two men named Vice and Nero and taken to deep ground. As they left, the livestream filled the final passage for Loveless, or at least the interpretation that Genesis made for it. After some time, the Turks mobilized to try and get to Zack before the military did. Tsong saw it as his responsibility to both him and Aerith, carrying the rest of her letters with him. As Zack and Cloud made it to the outskirts of the city, the military had already caught up with them. He laid Cloud down before leaving to face the Shinra army and fought as the memories of his comrades flashed before his eyes. Aerith, through the rain, felt the sudden departure as Zack looked up at the sky, gunned down by the very people he once thought himself a part of. With no troops in sight, Cloud dragged himself to Zack, still under the effects of all of his experimentation. Zack held him to his chest and told him that he was going to live, for both of them. In his final breath, he handed him the Buster Sword and passed on his dreams with it. The Turks' failure to save the fugitives hit hard, but over time, they continued their main objective. They traveled to Corel Prison after Rufus had discovered Avalanche movement there using his surveillance equipment. The player Turk acquired another support materia and saved a woman named Shalu Ari. Despite this, she tried to betray them due to a grudge against the Turks. Shalua's sister, Shelk, had been taken from her years before as a candidate for the soldier program, and she had joined Avalanche to find enough information to get her back. The player Turk still defended her from the Raven's attacks. Eventually, Sears and Verdo arrived, and Shalua ran with Sears to get away before the Shinra army was deployed. Skull had arrived and attacked the Turks, but Verdo offered himself up in exchange for their lives. Following this, the group met in Wall Market, the entertainment part of Sector 6 overrun with criminals, where they agreed to split the materia between the player Turk and Sears before leaving their separate ways. Reno, Rude, and Tsong all went to search for Verdo, who was waiting to be executed, and ended up making a deal with Rufus in exchange for his location. Unfortunately, Elena, the youngest sister of a Turk named Emma, ended up getting kidnapped by the Ravens. This forced the player Turk to give up their two support materia in exchange for her. As the player fought Avalanche to get it back, Elena found a new appreciation for the group. At the same time, Fujito tracked down Sears and took his materia by force. The player Turk stole a helicopter to chase after Avalanche, but by the time they had caught up to Fujito, it was already too late. Zirconia's summoning had begun. As they fought, Elf's body started to react to the support materia, and the materia in her body joined the rest. Fujito ran with it, and claimed that with it, the summon would be at full strength. As the player Turk informed Song that their original plan may not be possible anymore, they left Elf to be collected by his group. The remaining Turks gathered themselves to stop Fujito once and for all, but Verdo, Elf, Reno, Rude, and Song finally had the army catch up to them. Sears and the player Turk managed to find Fujito, but as they fought him, he used Elf's materia to transform his body. In his new form, he stabbed Sears and the player Turk was forced to fight the new monster. They managed to survive, but Fujito planned to take them down with him. As he approached, Sears tackled the monster and blew both himself and Fujito up. As the player Turk continued to run toward the summon, the president offered the other Turks a way out. To kill Verdo and Elf in exchange for their lives. Song took out his weapon to aim at the military, but then turned to the chief and his daughter. 
Verdo told him he made the right decision just before Song shot them both. As the rest of the Turks fought the now fully formed summon, they collapsed one by one. It was all resting on the player Turk. They remembered everyone they met on their journey, everyone they aimed to protect, and dealt the final blow. The summon exploded, disappeared, and broke apart into orbs seen across Midgar. The Turks returned, and the president held a meeting to discuss what would happen to them as punishment. While Scarlet thought they should be disbanded, Rufus arrived in their defense. He told them that regardless of what happened, they still managed to kill Verdo, proving their loyalty. Following the meeting, Rufus met with the Turks, who promised a loyalty to him. Both he and Song had staged Verdo and Elf's murder, and with it, the vice president made very powerful allies. That brings us back to Cloud, who, after making it to Midgar, reunited with Tifa. He claimed to be a soldier, first class in fact, and he needed work. While Fujito's avalanche had been taken down, its namesake had not been. In the years after Corel's village burning, Barrett learned much more about the planet and eventually put together his own avalanche in the Sector 7 slums. He believed that Shinra's Mako usage would eventually lead to the planet dying and set out to stop them by any means necessary. Tifa noticed that Cloud acted a little strange and decided to keep an eye on him. She recommended him to Barrett for a job, and on December 9th of Year 7, he joined Barrett to bomb Mako Reactor 1 along with Barrett's avalanche members, Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse. Barrett had Cloud set the bomb, where he started to have strange flashbacks before setting the timer. The operation was a success, and Cloud displayed some powerful abilities along the way. While their escape was rough, they made it out just in time before the explosion. As they all went their separate ways to board the train back, Cloud met Aerith selling flowers. The exchange was brief, but he bought one from her regardless before being chased by Shinra security. After surprising the group in the train, they made it back to Seventh Heaven where Cloud gave Tifa the flower he bought. As he went to collect his payment from Barrett, Jesse noticed the destruction of the bomb reached much more than she thought and blamed herself for having made a miscalculation somewhere along the way. Cloud doubled down on just wanting money and even told the group that he didn't care about the planet. But Tifa urged him to stay. As he kept trying to leave, she asked him if he forgot their promise. As he started to remember, Barrett came up and they settled on having him stick around the next mission, albeit for 2,000 gil. The next day, they headed for Mako Reactor 5, where they ran into all sorts of obstacles, including having to jump from their train. By the time they made it, Cloud once again had memories start to resurface, but with no idea what they were. Instead, he shook them off and continued to plant the bombs on the reactor. Unfortunately, President Shinra had expected them and sent a machine called the Air Buster to kill them during their escape. While they survived the attack, the bridge collapsed and left Cloud barely hanging onto the ledge. As he fell, he blacked out and began to speak to a familiar voice, making sure he was all right. He found himself in Eris's church in the Sector 5 slums. She made sure he was all right, and as they talked, she brought up her unique materia, one that was good for nothing that she treasured as a gift from her mother. Before they could talk for very long, Reno arrived at the church and Aerith asked Cloud if he'd take her back home. As he approached the red-haired man, Cloud couldn't recall who he was right away until something within him pieced it together. After remembering what a Turk was, Cloud threatened him before running out the back with Aerith. During their escape, Aerith noticed the color of his eyes and asked him if he was in Soldier. He was surprised that she even knew about the Mako infusion effects and told her yes, but she shied away from answering how she knew. Eventually, they made it back to her home, where she introduced Cloud to her mother, Elmira. She thanked him for protecting her daughter, but Cloud was in a hurry to get back to Sector 7. Aerith offered him to take him in the morning, but Cloud purposely walked out during the night to go alone. To his surprise, Aerith had been waiting for him and the two made their way to Sector 6. Once they got to a playground between the sectors, Aerith was curious about the similarities between Cloud and Zack and asked Cloud about his class in Soldier. He answered first, like he had been, and Aerith couldn't help but think of her past. She said that her first boyfriend was in first as well, but before she could go on, they saw Tifa riding in a carriage headed towards Sector 6's wall market. Aerith rushed after her as she knew the area's reputation, and together with Cloud, discovered that Tifa was being interviewed to be Don Corneo's bride. Confused by the entire situation, the two ran to his mansion and learned that the Don was in charge of wall market. Cloud wasn't allowed into the mansion because he was a man, but Aerith was free to waltz in. Before she could do something so dangerous, Cloud stopped her, and together they came up with a new plan. If only women could be allowed in, then Cloud would have to look the part. 
After finding all the right equipment, they went to the tailor to get dressed up and went inside Corneo's mansion. There, they found Tifa, and after some teasing, she told them what had happened. After Cloud fell, Tifa and Barrett noticed someone suspicious in the slums and found that he was one of Corneo's men. In an attempt to investigate, Tifa wanted to ask the man himself about what he was up to. The three headed up to see who got picked to be the man's bride. After he picked one of them, they cornered him in his room to interrogate him. It turned out that the Don had been ordered by Shinra to find a man with a gun for an arm. After verifying the location of Avalanche's base, they planned to destroy the Sector 7 pillar and have the plate come crashing down, killing everyone below and framing Avalanche for it. Shocked to hear that Shinra would go this far, the three planned to run straight back to the bar. However, the Don sprung a trap on them and they wound up in the sewers. Back at the Shinra building, Reef Twesty, now the director of urban planning for Shinra, tried to reason with the president, but to no avail. After Aerith, Cloud, and Tifa made their way out of the sewers, they ran through the train graveyard to get to Sector 7. By the time they made it, Barrett and his group were already on top of the pillar trying to stop Shinra. As they looked up, Wedge came crashing down, and they decided to split up. As Cloud and Tifa went above, Tifa sent Aerith to get Marlene from 7th Heaven and ordered the onlookers to start evacuating the others. On their way up to the pillar, Cloud and Tifa found Biggs and Jesse on their deathbed. While they fought hard, by the time Cloud and Tifa reunited with Barrett, Reno arrived in a helicopter and set the pillar to self-destruct. Reno fled after they fought, and as they tried to disarm the bomb, Song arrived in his own helicopter with Aerith taken prisoner. After explaining that the flower girl was the last ancient on the planet, Aerith made sure to tell Tifa that Marlene was alright before they left, just before the pillar started to collapse. Barrett, Cloud, and Tifa managed to escape just in time as President Shinra watched the damage from his office. As the three looked at the sector full of rubble, Barrett screamed for those he lost before Tifa explained that his daughter was okay. Even so, they lamented over the lost sector, over the fact that they caused the death of so many people. While Barrett's anger towards Shinra only worsened, Tifa was more unsure than ever. Cloud moved on ahead, both guilty that Aerith had gotten involved, but also curious after hearing the word ancient. His mind wandered back to Nibelheim, but was unable to fully remember what happened. All he remembered was that Ancient has something to do with Sephiroth. After Tifa and Barrett caught up to him, they headed to Eris's house to look for answers. They told Elmira what happened, and she explained to them everything she knew. How she met Aerith, how Shinra wouldn't harm her because of her heritage, and that Aerith had made a deal of her own, to go with Shinra in exchange for Malin's safety. The three felt indebted to Aerith, and without hesitation, Barrett asked for Elmira to watch over his daughter as he, Cloud, and Tifa looked for a way to infiltrate the Shinra building. They headed to Wall Market to see if they could find more information, and discovered that Shinra took Corneo away after he led the information about the pillar out. From there, they found a wire leading above the plate in the back of Wall Market, and climbed it up to reach the Shinra building. After successfully infiltrating the high-security skyscraper, they eventually found their way to the high-security floors using the mayor's keycard by guessing his password. While traveling through the vents, they were able to watch Shinra's meeting, as the directors discussed their plans to leave Midgar now that they have Aerith to show them the way to the Promised Land. Hojo discussed his plan to breed Aerith to produce an ancient that knew where the Promised Land was. As they snuck their way into his lab, they discovered a lion-like creature being held captive as well as another specimen. As Cloud looked inside, his mind started to slowly break, staring at the headless form of Genova. Eventually, they found Aerith, but Hojo threatened her safety and had the creature from before enter her container, claiming to save both of their endangered species. Frustrated, Barrett shot the container to free them, and the creature immediately attacked Hojo. The scientist quickly released one of his experiments to rescue him, and the lion creature offered to help the group defeat it. While the group was shocked that it was able to speak, the creature told them to refer to him as Red Thirteen, the name that Hojo gave him. After defeating the creature, Hojo escaped, and Red apologized for his fake behavior in the container before, but urged them to hurry and escape. Before they could come up with a plan, however, they entered the elevator and were quickly arrested by the Turks. They took Aerith away and had the rest of the party walk to President Shinra's office, where he explained more about what they planned to do with her that the ancients were called the Setra, and how he wished to find the promised land to build a new city. As the group was put into cells, they talked about the information they'd received, and eventually fell asleep. As Cloud woke up, however, he noticed that his cell door had been open, and the guard outside had been killed. 
He freed his friends, unsure of what was going on, and found out that Genova had left her chamber. Following the path of blood from the lab, they eventually ended up in the president's office again. There, they found the man stabbed to death by a sword, a familiar looking one. Palmer, the director of the space division, had been hiding and saw the whole thing, telling them that Sephiroth had come and killed the president while claiming that he wouldn't let them have the promised land. As they tried to figure out what his intentions were, they noticed Vice President Rufus being dropped off just outside. As the new president, he promised the party that he would rule the company with fear. Seeing no difference between the old and new president, Cloud had the rest of the party leave as he dealt with Rufus, who escaped during their battle. After making an enemy of Shinra yet again, the party found themselves surrounded by Shinra security. After searching through the lobby, they found a truck and motorcycle on display and used them to make their escape. Shinra sent officers and machines after them, but the party still managed to get away on the road. At the end of the highway, they all agreed to keep moving in pursuit of Sephiroth. Cloud wanted revenge, Barrett wanted to save the planet, Aerith wanted to learn more about her Cetra heritage, and Red 13 agreed to stay with them until he made it back home. While Tifa was still unsure of where their journey would take them, she felt like she didn't have much choice in the matter either. Either way, she felt safe in thinking Cloud would follow up on his promise. They eventually made their way northeast to the city of Calm, where the group asked Cloud just why he was so hell-bent on catching up to Sephiroth. There, he recounted what happened in Nibelheim, except the events he described were a little different than how Tifa remembered them being. Cloud described himself as the other first-class soldier that was paired up with Sephiroth, and as he told the events in clear detail, she wondered how he could recall everything so clearly, yet she had no memory of him ever being there. Cloud explained that while he remembered confronting Sephiroth in the Nibelheim reactor, he couldn't remember anything that happened after. While the news declared Sephiroth to be dead, Cloud didn't remember killing him and was determined to find out what really happened. The group wondered about Genova as well, eventually coming to the conclusion that Sephiroth himself must have taken her from the Shinra building. Aerith was even more confused hearing that Genova and Sephiroth were Cetra just like her. As the group left calm, they heard a rumor of a person in a black cape heading east and followed suit. On their way, they found a Chocobo ranch run by a man named Chocobill who warned them of a serpent in the marshlands called the Midgar Zolum. After purchasing chocobos to ride through to avoid the serpent's detection, the party rode through and saw that Sephiroth had already gotten to it. As they cut through the mithril mine, the party ran into the Turks, this time with their newest member Elena, who explained to them that they had been instructed to track Sephiroth and do whatever they could to stop everyone else. As Tsung joined in to berate her for letting information out too easily, she also let it slip that Sephiroth had been headed to Junon Harbor as well. Along the way, they got ambushed by Yuffie, who then tried to steal their materia. After the party defeated her, she ended up joining them, albeit not with the best of intentions. Once they arrived in Lower Junon, they helped save a girl named Priscilla from a giant monster before resting for the night, only to wake up to find the town preparing for Rufus, who was arriving in the city above. With no way of getting above, Priscilla and her pet dolphin helped the party climb the tower just as Rufus arrived. After they disguised themselves as Shinra infantrymen and sailors, they heard from the other Shinra officers that they were still looking for the black-caped men in the city and that Professor Hojo resigned from Shinra. Eventually, they stowed themselves aboard Rufus's ship and set off west. After a while, an alarm went off that had said an intruder was on board. As the group frantically looked for each other, they discovered that none of them had been caught. As they searched around, they found that all of the other Shinra officers on board were killed. After some time, they ventured further into the ship and found that the culprit was none other than Sephiroth. As Cloud tried to talk to him, Sephiroth didn't seem to remember him at all. As he escaped, he left behind a piece of Genova's arm that began to morph into a monstrous creature that resembled her. After the party defeated it, the arm disappeared and the party concluded that Sephiroth was aiming to bring his mother to the Promised Land. With the stowaway dealt with, the ship arrived in Costa del Sol, where the party relaxed, and Rufus blamed both Sephiroth and the party getting away on Heidegger before leaving on his helicopter. They eventually found Professor Hojo on the beach, who gave them little answers apart from him muttering to go west. Sometime after, they ended up on the trail to Mount Corel and heard from the trail guide there that Sephiroth went before them. After passing through the now fully constructed Corel reactor, the group made it to North Corel, what was left of Corel village. There, the villagers shunned Barrett and blamed him for the village's burning. After finding out that a man with a black cape and a number one tattooed on his arm had headed toward the ropeway, the party rushed over to get a ride up to the gold saucer. As they waited to board, 
Barry told everyone about Shinra's involvement with the fire and how he blamed himself for being the only person on board with the reactor's construction. After the party sympathized with his losses, they boarded the car to the gold saucer. Once there, the party split up and Cloud met up the owner, a muscular man named Dio, who mentioned to him that a man with a black cape had asked him some time ago if he had black materia. As the party searched through the place to find Sephiroth, they eventually met a fortune-telling cat riding a large moogle calling himself Kateseth. He claimed to be able to find anything, and so Cloud asked if he could locate Sephiroth. As the Moogle printed out fortunes, Kate Sith decided to accompany Cloud to see the result of them. After searching everywhere, the party cycled back to the Coliseum, only to find that the staff had been shot dead. As they examined the bodies, one of the survivors managed to say that they were all killed by a man with a gun for an arm. Before they could investigate further, Dio arrived and arrested the party for the murders and took them underneath the gold saucer to Corral Prison, a desert surrounded by quicksand. As they searched for Barrett inside, they found him next to another body, and he ran from them in a hurry. While trying to look for a way out, the rest of the group met Mr. Coates, who told them that the only way out was to get permission from the boss to enter and win a chocobo race. After catching up with Barrett, he finally told the party about how he lost his arm, and more importantly, that his best friend Dine had lost his too. He remembered that when he had the surgery to graft a machine gun to his right arm, his surgeon told him he was the second person he had done the procedure for. Putting together that his friend must have survived, Barrett just wanted to find him and apologize for what happened. Together with the others, he reunited with Dine, but something was different about him. During their conversation, he kept talking to Eleanor, his dead wife, as Barrett asked him why he's been killing people who weren't even involved with what happened. Where Barrett had only grown hate for Shinra, Dine's hate ran deeper. He wanted the whole world to suffer like he suffered after losing his wife and daughter. In an attempt to reason with him, Barrett told him that Marlene was still alive in Midgar, but Dine pointed his gun at him in response. In Dine's mind, he needed to kill Barrett and reunite Marlene with her mother the only way he knew how. Barrett had no choice but to fight him for Marlene's safety until Dine admitted defeat. He then told Barrett that even if he went back, Marlene wouldn't remember or accept him, not after killing so many people. As he tossed Barrett his wife's pendant, Dine approached the cliff edge and jumped off. After some time, the party went back to Mr. Coates and Barrett showed him the pendant to tell him that their boss wouldn't be around anymore. Still needing to finish the chocobo race, the group sent Cloud to compete for their freedom. After winning, Dio wrote him a letter to apologize for the misunderstanding and give them a vehicle to use, as well as where he saw Sephiroth headed to next, Gongaga. On their way to the village, they ran into the Turks discussing their crushes. The sunglasses wearing Rude had a soft spot in his heart for Tifa, but the group fought them anyway. They noted how odd it was that the Turks managed to track them though, leading them to believe that someone in the party was a mole. They looked around the destroyed reactor near the town and were able to find out that Scarlet was looking for huge materia to make the ultimate weapon. After she left, the party finally arrived in Gongaga, where they met a couple who noticed Cloud's eyes and realized he was a soldier. They asked if the party knew anything about their son, Zack, and looked to Aerith to ask if she was the girlfriend he had written them about. She immediately had to step away and later told Cloud all about him, that he was her first love but went missing. Cloud still had no memory of any soldier by that name, and when confronting Tifa about it, she claimed to not know him either. After searching through the village more, they decided to search elsewhere for Sephiroth until their vehicle broke down by Cosmo Canyon. Red 13 introduced himself as Nanaki and told everyone that he was finally home before running off to see his grandfather. As the party followed, Red explained his family's role as protectors of the planet and how ashamed he was of his cowardly father. Having returned home, he planned to stay in Cosmo Canyon. He eventually introduced them all to Bugenhagen, who claimed that despite Red being 48, he was closer to a teenager for his species. After requesting for his grandfather to show the others what he knew about the planet, Bugenhagen explained everything he knew about the livestream in his observatory. With a new understanding of the planet, the group retired to rest at the Cosmo Candle, a bonfire that never goes out. Barrett thought of his fallen comrades and vowed to save the planet. Aerith, after talking to the elders of the village, reflected on how alone she was as the last Cetra. Tifa collected her thoughts and debated talking to Cloud about what happened in Nibelheim, but second-guessed herself and wondered if she really knew who he was at all. As Red told Cloud his feelings towards his parents, however, Bugenhagen decided that enough was enough. He took the group to a cave, and they descended deeper into it and found several spirits that attacked them. 
As they progressed, Bugenhagen explained that they were the ghosts of the Gi tribe and the secret of the warrior that trapped them all there. Deeper inside, they found and defeated the ghost of the tribe leader, before Bugenhagen led Red further in to find the petrified remains of his father. With the truth revealed to him, Bugenhagen asked Red to continue his journey with the party, that even if they don't succeed in saving the planet, it's still their responsibility to try. Red agreed and accepted being his father's son of the great warrior Seto, and as he did, the statue began to weep. Once the party's vehicle was repaired, they continued their search for Sephiroth and traveled to Nibelheim. Both Cloud and Tifa were shocked to see their hometown completely unchanged from how they remembered it, as though the fire never happened at all. When talking to the villagers, they would deny that the event had ever taken place as well. During their time there, they ran into several people muttering about Sephiroth, wearing black capes with numbers tattooed on them. To bring something to Sephiroth, to become one with him, and to reunite with him. As the group explored, they read some of Hojo's notes in the Shinra Manor detailing an experiment he kept downstairs. As they explored, they found the monster lost number in a safe, and the key to the basement. There, they opened a coffin and awoke Vincent, who decided to talk to the team after learning they were after Sephiroth. The ex-Turk then explained how Sephiroth was born, and his regret for not stopping Lucrezia all those years ago. As Vincent rested longer, the rest of the party went further down into the basement, where they finally found Sephiroth. He explained that Genova was a calamity and not a Cetra before telling Cloud to join his reunion further north. As they left in pursuit of him, Vincent decided to join the group, and together they traveled through Mount Nibble and arrived in Rocket Town. Unable to find Sephiroth there, the party had no other way of traveling to the northern continent to continue. As they explored Rocket Town, they found a plane called the Tiny Bronco that they hoped to use. As they examined it, a woman named Shira pointed them in the direction of the owner, Captain Sid. She explained that Rufus was on his way, and that the captain had hoped he would re-establish the space program. After meeting Sid inside his rocket, he explained how his dream was to go to space, but he refused to let the party borrow his plane. After returning to Shira, Sid arrived and quickly showed the party how much of a temper he had. Shira explained how she felt guilty for his behavior, and told the story of why the rocket had failed to launch years before. After she recounted Sid saving her life and aborting the launch, Director Palmer arrived to tell Sid that Rufus was waiting for him. Rufus had no interest in the space program, however, and wanted to take the tiny Bronco to go after Sephiroth. As they argued, Shira had the party take the plane before Shinra could, but as they did, they caught Palmer trying to steal the plane. After fighting him, he ran away and the group took off with the plane. While they flew low enough to pick up Sid on the way, the plane was shot by Shinra and they crashed into the ocean. After explaining to Sid that they'd been racing to Sephiroth before Shinra, he agreed to join them after what they'd done. He explained that during their conversation, Rufus told him that Sephiroth was headed toward the Temple of the Ancients, and the party used the plane as a boat to look for clues of where to find it. However, on their way, Yuffie stole all their materia and ran to Butai. After chasing after her, they ran into the Turks who were off-duty relaxing before meeting Yuffie's father, Godo, Wutai's leader. He pretended not to know anything about Yuffie suspecting that the party was part of Shinra, but Yuffie appeared to call him a coward and run away again. Once the party cornered her, she apologized and explained that she thought that Materia would help her bring Wutai to its glory days. After offering the party their Materia back, she led them straight into a trap and ran away again. The party caught up again, only this time, they found her being kidnapped by Don Corneo. They formed a temporary truce with the Turks, who had been searching for the Don as well after kidnapping Elena, and went to track him down. They climbed the mountain of the Dachau statues, gods that looked over Wutai, and found both Yuffie and Elena tied to one of the faces. Cloud's party hesitated as Corneo threatened to kill them, but Reno and Root forced him to the edge where he held on for his life. As soon as Reno stomped on his fingers, the Don's grip loosened and he fell down the mountain. With Yuffie and Elena saved, Reno got orders from Shinra to go after Cloud, but in light of everything that had happened, he told his team not to bother. It was their day off after all. Yuffie returned the stolen materia back and rejoined the party, but before she left, she participated in several duels to reach the top of the pagoda of the five mighty gods. At the end, she fought her father, who rewarded her with the materia to summon their god, Leviathan. There was some pushback in going against tradition, and while Yuffie argued back, Goro decided to tell her why things worked out the way they did. Shinra looked to crush any opposition, and so by losing the war, Wutai may have been reduced to a small village, but he was still allowed to survive. He admitted that Yuffie may have a point, however, and that strength needs a purpose as much as purpose needs strength. 
He asked the party to take care of Yuffie to impart the same lesson. And after Yuffie called him dad for the first time, Goto promised to watch over Wuta in her absence. After the touching words, the others left, and Goto brought Yuffie in close before she joined them, and asked if she thought that they'd still want their material once their mission was over. After the party left, they found someone who claimed that he sold an item called the Keystone, something that would unlock the temple, to Dio, and the party rushed to the gold saucer to get to it before Shinra. Once there, they found it in Dio's museum, and he agreed to let Cloud take it, only after participating in fights in the Coliseum. Unfortunately, once they got the Keystone, the tram going back had been broken. Kate Sith offered them to stay at the hotel until it was repaired, and the group went over their journey so far with each other. As everyone slept, Cloud and one of the members of the party decided to sneak out to go on a date. They ended up playing the leads in a play, and rode the ferris wheel where they shared their feelings with each other. On their way back, they spotted Kate Sith trying to run away with the Keystone, but by the time they caught up to him, it was too late. He handed it to Tsung, who then took it and flew away in his helicopter. Kate Sith then confessed that he had been spying on them for Shinra, but that things weren't completely as they seemed. He explained that he'd been controlling the Toy Cat from the Shinra building, but he wanted to stay with them on their journey. While Cloud tried refusing his request at first, Kate Sith played Marlene's voice through his body, threatening the girl's life if they didn't let him stay in the party. As they walked back to the hotel, he promised to show them what the Temple of the Ancients was, and Cloud reluctantly admitted defeat. The next day, Kate Sith followed up on his promise, and the party arrived at the temple. They found Song wounded, and he explained that Sephiroth was already inside. Using the Keystone, the party followed after and was shown a vision of what had happened before. This let them see that Sephiroth had planned to absorb the power of the live stream. As the group caught up to another vision of him, Sephiroth explained that he was going to use the Black Materia to injure the planet, to force it to use its spiritual energy to heal itself and absorb that energy for himself to become a god. Once the vision ended, Cloud lost control of himself and began to repeat Sephiroth's plan. After snapping out of it, the group examined the murals and saw that the Black Materia summoned a meteor capable of destroying entire planets. They learned that the entire temple was the Black Materia and would shrink as they solved the puzzles inside until it became an orb again. However, anyone left inside solving the puzzles would be crushed in the process, making it impossible to get without a sacrifice. Kate Seth, having heard the whole conversation, offered to solve the puzzles as his body was robotic anyway, and despite Cloud's uncertainty, he accepted. As he solved the puzzle inside and the temple shrunk down into the Black Materia, Aerith explained that Sephiroth wouldn't be able to use it without using a lot of spiritual energy. That because he wasn't an ancient, he wouldn't be able to find a place like the Promised Land to gather enough energy to cast Meteor. Unfortunately, Sephiroth arrived to explain to them that while he wasn't an ancient, he obtained all of their knowledge by traveling through the livestream. As Sephiroth approached Cloud, his body began to move on its own. He handed the Black Materia to Sephiroth and started to break down, wondering why he would do such a thing. As he collapsed on the floor, a second model Kate Sith arrived, and the group took Cloud and escaped. While he was unconscious, Aerith spoke to Cloud in a place called the Sleeping Forest and told him that she would deal with Sephiroth alone as it was her responsibility as a Cetra to protect the planet. As she told him she was headed for the City of the Ancients, the Forgotten Capital, Sephiroth invaded Cloud's mind to tell him that they needed to stop her. After waking up, Cloud spoke to the others about her plans, but was scared of losing control again. They convinced him to keep going, and set out for the city. On their way, they found Bone Village, a settlement full of fossils, and they were told that a girl went through the sleeping forest from Cloud's dream using a lunar harp. After excavating one of their own, they used it to open the road to get to the City of the Ancients. There, they found stairs leading on the ground where they saw Aerith praying. As Cloud approached her, he started to feel the same feeling as before and took out his sword in front of her. Before he could swing it at her, his friends called out to him and snapped him out of his trance. Just as Aerith opened her eyes after finishing her prayer to see him, Sephiroth appeared from above them and stabbed her through the chest. Her ribbon fell off, releasing her materia into the water underneath, and Cloud caught her before she fell to the floor. Unsure of what to do next, Cloud gripped Eris's body and questioned everything they had been doing as Sephiroth kept taunting him. He left Cloud, telling him that he should stop pretending to have emotions, and dropped another piece of Genova. After it morphed and they defeated it, the party said their goodbyes. Cloud then picked up Aerith and laid her body in the water where she sank deeper into the planet. Before they left, Cloud addressed his friends and chose to finally be honest with them. That there was something inside him that he didn't understand, that took over his body, 
but even though he felt like he couldn't fully control himself, he had to go after Sephiroth, for Aerith, for Nibelheim, and for the planet. After leaving the city, the group wondered where to head next when Cloud started to have visions of Sephiroth. From the visions, he could feel his presence and knew to head north. They eventually made it to Icicle Inn, where they found an abandoned house full of equipment. After playing the tapes inside, they learned all about Eris's parents, Gast and Falna, the weapons, and Genova. After getting through the Great Glacier and climbing Gaia's Cliff, the party made it to the North Crater, and were able to put together that Sephiroth planned to cast Meteor there using the planet's energy. As they ventured into the crater itself, they saw people in black capes mindlessly falling in. Shinra had made it as well, thinking they had found the Promised Land. They brought Hojo with them too, but he had a different idea of where they were heading. After going through the harsh winds in the crater, the party reached the end of the whirlwind maze and found Sephiroth. There, he claimed to not need his body anymore and vanished without a trace. Cloud began to feel the same compulsion from before, but suddenly another Sephiroth rushed in and transformed into another Genova appearing creature. After defeating it, it dropped the Black Materia and Cloud began to understand. He gave the Black Materia to one of the others to hold and kept going deeper into the crater. As he and his friends approached, however, they stepped into an illusion of Nibelheim. There, they saw how the events actually happened, but Cloud refused to accept it. Sephiroth appeared with them and explained that all of his memories had been fake, that he was just another one of Hojo's experiments, an attempt at making a Sephiroth copy. Cloud tried to deny it, but as he recounted his memories, they were all filled with gaps he couldn't explain. As he struggled to make sense of who he was, Sephiroth tricked one of the party members into joining the rest of the group with an illusion. After Cloud exited the illusion, he appeared next to the rest of Shinra in a cave. There his friends caught up with him, and Cloud took the Black Materia from them before apologizing. As Cloud left, Hojo explained to everyone about his reunion theory. Initially, he believed that those with Genova cells would feel compelled to join Genova, but Sephiroth disproved that. Sephiroth had been calling those with Genova cells to him, including Genova herself. As Sephiroth's influence over Cloud grew, his real body emerged, encased in a cocoon, and had Cloud place the Black Materia inside. As he cast Meteor, the weapons all across the planet started to awaken in his response. The cave collapsed, and Rufus had everyone board the airship they used to get there to escape. Tifa was knocked out during the escape, and as she dreamt, she was filled with memories of regret. While she knew something was wrong with Cloud's memories, she didn't know how to help him. After seven days, she woke up in Junon, and Barret caught her up to speed. The weapons were on the loose, but with Sephiroth keeping himself safe in a barrier within the crater, they began to attack anything that seemed like a threat. Meteor was on its way, and while everyone was trying to figure out how to stop it, Rufus focused on stopping the weapons. Despite this, Rufus believed the public had to have a face to put the blame on, and decided to execute Tifa and Barret to appease them. Before they could go through with it, however, Kate Sith turned on Shinra and helped to rescue Barret. As they tried to figure out a way to escape, Shinra fought against the Sapphire weapon using their Mako cannon. After some time, Tifa escaped through a tear that the weapon created, and they all left in the same airship that Sid stole. The team eventually found Cloud and Medil suffering from the effects of Mako poisoning. Unable to leave him, Tifa chose to stay with him and told the others to move on without her. After they separated, Kate Sith informed the others that Shinra got huge materia from Nibelheim, and they set out to get to others first. After getting two of them, Sid, now leading the party, found out that the last one was in Junon's underwater reactor. Before they left to get to it, they went to check in on Tifa and Cloud, where the livestream started to burst from the ground. Ultimate Weapon attacked Sid before running away, but as everyone tried to escape, Tifa and Cloud fell into the livestream. There, Tifa was overwhelmed as she heard the voices of the livestream call out to her, but after a while, she found herself in Cloud's subconscious. They worked together to piece the fragments of his mind in one place using the shared memories of their lives. The pieces of himself shared everything with her from their childhood, his dreams, his feelings for her, and were able to understand what happened in Nibelheim. Zack was the soldier that came with Sephiroth, but Cloud had been with them, hiding his face underneath his helmet. With these revelations, Tifa put the fragments of Cloud back together and proved to him that he was real, that Sephiroth and Hojo were wrong. They left the livestream and found themselves together with the others. Cloud told everyone the truth about his fabricated memories, that his own insecurities in combination with Genova's influence created the false persona they had all been traveling with. Despite everything that happened, his friends accepted him and together they headed to Junon. 
the group broke into the underwater reactor, but found that Shinra had already loaded the huge material on the submarine. As Rufus distracted them, the submarine got away, and the party boarded their own submarine to go after it. After they blew up Shinra's sub and took the huge materia, they found another item on the water called the Key to the Ancients. After hearing that Shinra was transporting their materia to Rocket Town, the party found them there trying to launch the rocket into Meteor using the huge materia. As Sid and Cloud argued over what to do, Palmer launched the rocket with them still inside. While Sid's dream of going to space had come true, they had to rush before they were killed. They took the huge materia and made their way to the escape pods, but Sid was pinned down. To their surprise, Shira had been on board and helped free him, finally getting rid of her guilty conscience. Together, they all left through the escape pod, and the unmanned rocket managed to remove a piece of meteor. With it still headed to the planet, the party decided to go to Bugenhagen to see if he knew what they could do to stop it. After speaking to him, they wondered how Aerith was so sure she could stop Sephiroth, and went to the Forgotten Capital to find answers. There, Bugenhagen was able to listen to the Ancients, and explain to the others about Holy and the White Materia. Cloud told him that Aerith died before it could go off, but the city had another answer for them. Using the key they found to activate a music box caused the altar to show them that the White Materia was glowing green. The message reached the planet to cast Holy, but Sephiroth was somehow blocking it. On their way back, Kate Sith informed everyone that Rufus had moved the Mako Cannon from Junon to Midgar and was planning on killing Sephiroth with it. He also got word that Diamond Weapon was on its way to the city, but let Barrett know that Marlene was safe. The two argued over their methods of saving the planet and the people of Midgar, but ultimately decided to fight the weapon themselves before it could do any damage. After fighting it for a while, the weapon turned and fired at Midgar as Rufus fired the Mako Cannon and killed it. As the beam traveled through its body, it continued and shattered Sephiroth's barrier on the other side. The attack from the weapon still made it to Midgar, however, and destroyed the top of the Shinra building with Rufus caught in the blast. With the barrier gone, Hojo planned to use the Mako Cannon to fuel Sephiroth with Mako. Reef tried to stop him as it would siphon too much Mako from the reactors and destroy the entire city. Seeing no other choice, Reef dropped his act as Katesith and explained the situation to the others. Because they couldn't just turn off the reactor or blow it up without endangering the people of the city, they had no choice but to go stop Hojo directly. As the party flew to Midgar, Reeve demanded Heidegger and Scarlet to stay out of their way. In response, they threw him out of the room and increased the security instead. With Shinra forces all around the city, the party parachuted their way down. On their way, they bumped into the Turks, who didn't even want to fight them at this point, and even gave Cloud the option of skipping their encounter entirely. Heidegger and Scarlet tried to stop them as well, with little care what Hojo was up to, but the party still managed to get through. Once they reached Hojo, he revealed it was Sephiroth's father, and injected himself with Genova cells to try to prevent them from stopping the cannon. While they managed to defeat him, they still had only seven days until Meteor came crashing down. With uncertainty about whether or not they would be successful in stopping Sephiroth, Cloud told the others to spend time with their loved ones before deciding to risk their lives. Both Cloud and Tifa stayed behind and talked about their time together underneath the airship, about those that they lost and their time in the livestream. Unable to say the words she wanted to, Tifa decided to tell Cloud how she felt without them. The following morning, after finding out that the others had been in the airship the whole time, everyone joined together in memory of Aerith to finish what she started. Vincent had one more loose end to tie up, however, and traveled with the party to find a crystal cave near Nibelheim. Inside, he found Lucrezia, and all of his memories of her flooded back. She isolated herself after finding out she couldn't die, but was being plagued by Sephiroth's skull in her dreams. Knowing nothing of what happened apart from the news of his death, she asked Vincent to tell her if he was still alive. Before Cloud could speak up, Vincent held his arm to deny him and lie to the woman he loved. After returning later, Lucrezia was gone, and Vincent hoped to stop Sephiroth from the torment he put her through. Red 13 had unresolved business of his own and went back to Cosmo Canyon. When he got there, however, the villagers told him that Bugenhagen had become very sick after coming back from the forgotten capital. Red rushed to his grandfather's side where Bugenhagen asked what he was still doing there. While Red tried to tell him that his duty was to protect Cosmo Canyon, Bugenhagen disagreed. Being a protector meant protecting more than just one place. In the grand scheme of things, everything returned to the livestream one day. Bugenhagen told his grandson to go out and live, to explore the planet and maybe find love. With his final breath, he gave Red the headdress he'd been holding onto and shut his eyes. When going back to the others, he told Cloud that his grandfather left on a journey. 
Understanding what he meant, Cloud told him that maybe they'd see him again one day. After gathering everything they needed, the party descended deeper into the crater until they were met with another giant form of Genova. After defeating it, they fell deeper until they saw the heart of the planet itself. They saw the bright shining light of Holy emanating from the center, unable to escape as Sephiroth stood in its way. As they engaged with Sephiroth, he transformed himself into a new godly form. While they fought him in the heart of the planet, the Turks were busy trying to evacuate the citizens of Midgar. As they struggled between the four of them to evacuate the city, Verdo showed up with all of the other Turks. Once Sephiroth's first form had been defeated, he transformed once again, this time with seven wings. After a long battle, they defeated Sephiroth, but they still had no clue whether it was in time or whether Holy would be able to count a meteor. While the others left to go back to the airship, Tifa noticed something was wrong with Cloud. Although they defeated Sephiroth, he could still feel his presence within his mind. Before he knew it, he found himself cascading into the recesses of his mind where Sephiroth was waiting for him. There, he killed the last part of Sephiroth, whereupon he was sent to the livestream. Once his form fully dissolved, the livestream started to envelop Cloud as a hand reached out to him. Before he could take it, he woke up to see the ground crumbling beneath him and Tifa reaching out to catch him. After catching her in the chaos, he had a revelation that the promised land was the world of the livestream, and that one day, they would see Aerith again there. As they made their way out, Holy followed closely behind and erupted from the crater. Miles away, Meteor descended closer to Midgar and caused several storms of fire to destroy most of the city. As Holy collided with Meteor, the energy between them caused a destructive ripple effect. While all hope felt lost, the party looked in astonishment as the livestream traveled from all over the planet toward the collision. Aerith, through her power as a Cetra, managed to call upon everyone's consciousness in the livestream to fight back against Meteor. Holy dissolved any part it touched until it was reduced to a powerless fragment of what it once was. Aerith had been on a journey of her own the entire time and learned a lot about the livestream since her death. Swirling around an endless sea of thoughts and memories, she noticed that she was the only one who retained the consciousness she had when she was alive. From the time she died to the time she gathered energy for Meteor, she roamed around and met many spirits. Jesse, Biggs, and Wedge felt so much guilt for the lives they had taken, but Aerith showed them how much good they did as well. Dine felt undeserving of being reunited with his loved ones, but Aerith managed to tell him the things that Barrett wanted to say. That they both had done terrible things, but it's never too late to try to do better. She also met President Shinra, but his greed and obsession made him unwilling to be fully taken by the livestream. Instead, she felt a dark presence inside the livestream, one that was separated from the normal flow. She saw the president become swept up in it, and felt the familiar presence of Sephiroth from it. When Aerith met Zack, her new feelings were mixed with her old, but they both shared concern over Cloud. Together, they figured out what had happened to his memory, but felt powerless to stop it. When Cloud and Tifa fell into the livestream in Medil, it was Aerith that helped guide Tifa out of the void and into Cloud's subconscious. Eventually, she met Hojo, who explained that his son's will had infected the livestream along with those that were affected by Genova. When Sephiroth had called for more energy in the North Crater, Hojo offered himself to be taken while warning Aerith. Genova, now within the livestream, would always reassemble and infect the planet. Aerith tried to argue against him, but Hojo just laughed before he disappeared. When Meteor met Holy and Aerith guided the spirits to help save the planet, they may have stopped the threat of the Black Materia, but things weren't over yet. In stopping Meteor, the livestream that traveled across the planet had also affected those it came across. Buildings were destroyed, mountains were flattened, and the landscape had completely changed. Genova's infection within the livestream had also caused a new disease to surface called Geostigma. Those that were infected would start to develop a number of symptoms, but the most notable one was having sores that bled a black ooze. Rumors of its contagious nature would start to spread, as well as it being tied to Mako usage. Shinra had all but collapsed, with the reactors no longer active not only in Midgar, but across the planet. After Meteor Fall, the group went back to the Forgotten Capital to give their respects to Aerith. From then on, the group would start tying ribbons around them as a reminder of her. They decided to stay in contact, but to go their separate ways. Before leaving, Yuffie asked them for their materia to take back home to Wutai. With Shinra no longer being a threat, Cloud gave her his healing materia and told her anything dangerous should be kept with him. Cloud, Tifa, and Barret visited Almira in Calm. She had stayed there with relatives during the crisis, and after telling her what happened, they picked up Marlene. Almira said she understood that they did everything they could, but it didn't erase the feelings of guilt that the three had. 
The four of them ended up returning to Midgard to help clean up the place. Reeve went as well and formed the World Regenesis Organization, or the WRO, to oversee construction and healthcare. A lot of the funding came from an anonymous benefactor and after some time, the citizens formed a city from Midgard's remains between the third and fourth sectors called Edge. With help from the citizens, Tifa opened Seventh Heaven again and encouraged Cloud to start a delivery business. Barrett eventually left to figure out what he wanted to do with himself and had Cloud and Tifa take care of Marlene. With Mako not being used anymore, everything slowed down and cities started to have a shortage of food. Cloud and Tifa tried to make ends meet, but Zack and Aerith's passing were fresh in his mind. He still carried the guilt of what happened to them and would get reminders of them wherever he went. One day, when he was visiting Eris's church, a boy named Denzel found his cell phone on his bike and called the bar. He had been infected with geostigma, but Cloud took him home to Seventh Heaven to take care of him, despite not knowing it was contagious. Even so, they nursed him back to health and heard his story. Denzel had been orphaned after the Sector 7 platefall and lived with a woman named Ruvi. When the livestream erupted from the planet, Ruvi kept Denzel safe, but she got hit from the blast. The next morning, he found her dead, suffering from the symptoms of geostigma. After meeting a man named Gaskin, they buried her body and evacuated with other survivors. Gaskin eventually died following the construction of Edge, and Denzel joined other orphans to scavenge for food. It was on one of those trips that he found Cloud's bike and called Seven Heaven, desperately asking for help until he passed out with the black ooze dripping from his head. Tifa felt like it was her responsibility to take care of him after their involvement with the pillar's collapse. Cloud agreed to the idea of having him live with them, but this didn't change the weight on his mind. Denzel looked up to him, but Tifa could tell there was something that Cloud wasn't opening up about. Barrett's journey took him around the world, and he eventually met with Sakaki, a man who tried to make prosthetic arms for Barrett in the past. Back then, Barrett felt like whatever the old man made for him wasn't enough because nothing he would wield felt destructive enough. With his rage for Shinra gone, he asked Sakaki to make a new arm, one with a hand. As he traveled, Barrett saw how much the lack of Mako usage changed everything. When visiting Sid, he saw that they had been using oil from a refinery east of Rocket Town. Shira had contracted Geostigma, and Barrett decided to stay to help Sid build his new airship. Together, they thought that travel with it could fix many of the world's problems, delivering food, taking people to hospitals, and getting people a cure if they ever found one. Unfortunately, Sid explained that the oil Derek hadn't been getting results, and they were living off of what little oil they had. Barrett asked him if the reactors could be used just temporarily for the people suffering. The answer was no, but Sid was still surprised to hear the old leader of Avalanche even make the suggestion. Barrett wanted to make up for his past mistakes and the lives he took, and so Sid gave him a new goal. With Mako usage out of the question, they came up with the idea to search for areas full of oil instead. After they split up, Nanaki had soul searched as well and traveled around trying to figure out what his purpose in life was. With a lifespan of up to a thousand years, he was still young and with many questions about his life. He had a feeling of anxiety that would pop up from time to time that he would call Gilligan, just for the sake of identifying the feeling. When visiting Yuffie in Wutai, he started to understand a bit more about it. It was the feeling of dread. Dreading the day he'd outlive all of his friends. He came to think of himself as a protector of the human race, as well as a means of reminding it of its past. Even still, Nanaki had tried to live with beasts as well, and narrowly avoided being hunted himself. When a hunter's son called out the color of his fur, he realized how much he resented the name Hojo gave him. In the wake of the food shortage, hunters made a big profit off of bear meat, and Nanaki spent time taking care of two orphan cubs. Unfortunately, after they had grown up, he found himself in the middle of a feud between them and the hunters that killed their mother. Unable to stop the fighting from either side, Nanaki's adopted bears died. In his rage, he tried to get revenge but was outnumbered. He woke up to Vincent, who had saved him by chance. He had been investigating the Turks' actions and managed to see Nanaki in trouble just in time. He hadn't realized how much time he spent in nature and eventually returned to the world of humans. He visited Sid, who took him on a test flight where he really took in just how small they were in comparison to the planet at large. After a while he met with Vincent again and confided in him about his fear. He imagined overseeing Midgar overgrown with greenery, but among the humans there, he would know no one. Vincent reassured him that that would never be the case. Being immortal himself, he told Nanaki that he would always know him. When Yuffie returned home to Wutai, she saw that the livestream had done a lot of damage to it. She would spend much of her time taking care of those that were injured, but many people started contracting geostigma and blamed her return on it. At the time, they knew nothing about it and just called it the Midgar disease until they gathered more information on it. 
Together with her friend Yuri, Yuffie tried to find a cure for the disease and went to the site where Shinra tried setting up their reactor. They hoped to find material that could help, but instead they found a dark body of water. Yuffie could feel a presence from inside and tried to run with Yuri, but he was caught in it. While he managed to get free of it, Yuri contracted the geostigma soon after. Nanaki, who was in the area, helped them escape, and together they wondered if there was any material that could cure everyone. He wondered that since it was a new disease, maybe the ancients hadn't developed material that could cure it. After returning to Wutai, it spread more despite quarantining the infected patients. Whatever was causing the disease wasn't contagious, but most people were already so fearful that they still treated others the same. After talking with Yuri, however, they managed to figure out more about it. Those who were infected were those that thought they were going to die through injuries or other illnesses. The lack of hope seemed to have something to do with it, but when Yuri and Yuffie thought about the water from before, they alerted Godo. With their new findings, everyone was under instruction to boil water and to avoid thoughts of dying. She continued to help the patients as things kept getting worse, but never gave up looking for material that could one day help them. Rufus Shinra, who had survived the attack on the Shinra building, had broken several bones in his body. With the help of the Turks, he was relocated to calm during Meteor's descent. Once the livestream had saved the planet, he was one of the few who recognized what the others had done. For the general public, however, they believed the planet saved itself and destroyed anything it passed to do it. During his recovery, Rufus had the Turks get any information they could regarding the changes, but ended up being taken by two people. It was his idea to construct a new city, but his first captor, Killgate, took the credit for himself with the idea of ruling it. He'd eventually be killed by Rufus's second captor, Killmeister, one of Hojo's old assistants. Through his research, he was able to determine that Geostigma was linked to Sephiroth, and that the pain caused from it could be slowed using the tails of Nibelheim bears. They were a key ingredient in making soldier stimulants in the past, and only became more valuable. The more he examined Geostigma, he found that the black liquid shared a consciousness, one that he thought belonged to both Genova and Sephiroth. Killmeister was eventually killed, and Rufus was taken to a place called Healing Lodge where he and the Turks set up their base of operations. They made it a place for patients of Geostigma to be treated, and while Rufus was ambitious about rebuilding things, he also knew he'd have to give back to the world after all the destruction Shinra had caused. While Geostigma was a mystery to everyone for a long time, Sephiroth and Aerith knew its mechanics from within the livestream. After Cloud killed him, Sephiroth could feel himself dissolving into the livestream and chose to relinquish all the good parts of him, all of his memories from before he learned the truth about his birth. Refusing to let himself be caught on the flow of the planet and its cycle of death and rebirth, he detached himself from the system as a whole. Instead, he latched himself onto Cloud and made the core of his being dependent on Cloud's memories of him. As long as Cloud remembered him, his spirit would never truly die. As he traveled the livestream, he started to infect people with geostigma, and when they died, they added to the corruption within. As the dark presence inside the livestream grew, Aerith noticed other spirits consumed with hate started appearing. She cleansed them of their negative emotions to help them join the livestream properly, but the numbers kept adding up. Eventually, she found the spirits of other Cetra to help. She found fragments of consciousness belonging to people that she knew, and infused her own memories with them to help. As things on the planet's surface got worse, so did things in the livestream. While she wanted to somehow ask Cloud for help, she was scared of how he might react. Sephiroth was the opposite, however, as he wanted Cloud to know that he was the source of all the suffering happening. He tried conjuring himself up to the surface, but because he let all of the memories of his former self go, he couldn't resurrect so easily. Instead, he found three people's own image from within the livestream and created three boys on the surface. They were part of him, but still remained their own thoughts and emotions. Sephiroth knew that if he could find any part of Genova's body on the surface, he could bring himself back and had the three search. Having Genova wouldn't be enough though. To physically manifest again, he would need for them to encounter someone who remembered Sephiroth, and for that, he knew Cloud would always be an easy choice. Aerith managed to find out about the three entities, and even considered projecting herself onto the surface the same way. Ultimately, she decided against it, and wanted to see Cloud in the form that he'd recognize. She needed to warn him, but was still unsure of what to do once she did. Using the information he had gotten, Rufus had the medicine to suppress the pain of geostigma start to be manufactured. His involvement was kept a secret, and so to everyone else, it seemed like Shinra acted on their own or under different leadership. The company name itself was stained with the terrible reputation it deserved, but Rufus still tried to change people's mind about them. He teamed up with the WRO to distribute the medicine for free, while the Turks worked as both security and reconnaissance. 
At some point during the distribution, some of their medicine was stolen, leading them to investigate a man named Fabio. He needed it for his younger brother, and in searching for Fabio, they met a man named Evan Townshend. Evan had a complicated history with Midgar, and had been separated from his mother Annette the day the Sector 7 pillar was destroyed. When he returned home, she had already left in a hurry with a man named Nick Foley. She left him a large amount of money before she left, but any hope of trying to get in contact with her again shattered after Meteor descended from the sky. Using the money, he started up a detective agency with Fabio and his friends Kyrie Kanan and Leslie Kyle. They called it the Mireille Detective Agency, after Kyrie's late grandmother, and did a combination of real detective work and trickery, telling people that Kyrie could read the livestream to find their loved ones or belongings. Evan managed to lie to the Turks about knowing anything about Fabio, and took on a new client, a middle-aged man looking for his soldier's son. Unlike his other clients, Evan felt as though he could relate to the regret the father shared with them. The older gentleman explained that he got the photo from a man with geostigma who had an entire bag full of photos. Before he could get any more information about his son, the man died from the disease. The picture itself was of several people standing in front of a large mansion, including the man's son and Evan's mother, with Nick Foley's name written on the back. Elena would eventually catch up with Fabio, but didn't kill him after seeing he had stolen the medicine for his brother. After finding more information about Evan, the Turks were ordered to take him to Helen Lodge. Evan and Kyrie tried to put up a fight, but they weren't any match for Reno and Rude. In the car ride over, the pair warned Kyrie to stop her ancient act. As it turned out, just because Hojo was dead didn't mean the other Shinra scientists weren't still interested in experimenting on Acetra. The girl had recalled the last time she heard the word, and confided in them about when she found out her parents died. Living in a sect of five slums, she remembered the girl in pink named Aerith that told her to rush home just as her parents' body were being delivered home to her grandmother. The Turks explained that Aerith had died, and after remembering how badly she treated her back then, Kyrie decided to listen to them. They took a look at the photo as well, and determined it was taken in Nibelheim before arriving at Helen Lodge. Once there, they brought Evan to Rufus and explained to him that his mother worked for Shinra as a secretary. Not only that, but he told him that they were half-brothers and he had been looking for Evan to stand in for him. Evan's friends came to rescue him in the confusion, but with the information he learned, he started trying to find a way to Nibelheim. His friends were ordered to construct a monument in the center of Edge, while Evan made up with the Turks. After speaking to Dr. Drake, an ex-Shinra employee, he learned about Genova and saw her mummified remains in photos that he kept. The image had burned into his mind, but he continued to find a way out of Edge. He managed to meet Cloud through his delivery service, who told him he could only get gasoline from three sources, Shinra, the WRO, and Don Corneo. After securing a map of the new landscape from Tifa, Evan went to his friend Leslie to see where he could find him. He and his pregnant wife Merle flinched at the name, but Leslie managed to show Evan the way. After saying Cloud had sent him, the Don was both fearful and angry, but promised to deliver the gas. His new business had essentially been to blackmail the people who frequented his place, and take down missing people's inquiries from the bulletin board to then charge people to find them. While he looked for one of the missing photos, Evan saw both Leslie's wife and Tifa in photographs on the wall, and tore them off. He showed Evan a photo of himself posted by Nick, just a little after Meteor Fall. His mother had tried looking for him, but the Don got in the way. He kept copies of every photo, and when Evan returned to Leslie, he told him everything about him. Leslie had worked for the Don at some point, but after Kyrie met Evan, their whole friend group started to want to live different lives. Surprised to see how much of an effect he had on them, Evan told him he could use his place to hide from the Don. Later that night, while he and Kyrie waited for a delivery, Leslie met with them instead with gallons of stuff and two machine guns. He had burned down the Don's estate and stolen the items before leaving after realizing he needed a real end to his old life. The Don may have survived, but Leslie took Evan up on his promise and moved into his place temporarily with Merle. As Evan and Carrie took off, however, Fabio tried to attack the Turks near one of their warehouses. They had no choice but to kill him, with his final words being, for Evan. Confused by this, Reno and Rude decided to follow Evan on his journey. Once Carrie and Evan arrived in Lower Junon, they decided to take a break by the water and run into Nanaki. Evan was frightened at first and tried to shoot at him, even blowing up his truck in the process, but stopped after hearing Kyrie drowning. The darker parts of the water practically dragged her down, but Nanaki managed to save her life. After taking her to the doctor, Evan apologized to him and the Turks started to arrive. Song and Elena had been in the area already, searching for Genova's body, and checked in to see what happened. As Evan regrouped with Reno, Song checked in on Kyrie and overheard her speaking to a man she seemed familiar with. She called him Kadaj and asked how he could be there after dying in a fire years before. 
As Tsung moved closer, he saw that the young man had silver hair and a presence he knew all too well. Kadash touched both of them and he instantly lost consciousness. When they came to, Kyria described him with the memory of her childhood friend. At that moment, Song realized that Kadash had used Genova's mimetic ability and warned her not to go near him again. Once everyone grouped up, Song paid the doctor for helping Kyrie and explained what happened to Fabio. Shocked to hear of his death, Evan and Kyrie tried to run away. Elena impulsively shot Evan's shoulder and caused him to pass out, but had the wound stitched up. As an apology, the Turks decided to help Evan get to Nibelheim. There, they met the soldier their client was looking for, but as for Evan's mother, he explained that she had left ages ago. Reno and Rude were sent back to Midgar, but Song and Elena continued to help Evan in concern for his safety. They continued to Icicle Lodge, where Annette had been staying, but when staying the night, Kadaj appeared as Fabio to Evan and threatened him to give up what he knew about Genova. He handed him the same photo Dr. Drake had shown him of her covered in blood. Kadaj had searched through the doctor's mind and saw Genova in the Shinra building, but after seeing her missing, he shifted his focus to Evan. As he searched through Evan's mind, he realized that he knew nothing more than what the doctor told him. As Tsung caught up, Kadaj did the same thing to him, and once he realized that they both didn't know anything, he forced the Turk to fall forward and left. As Tsung and Alina went to their chopper to search for him, Evan went back to find Kyrie, but found the inn on fire. Kyrie was terrified of the flames. That's what killed her friends when she was a child, but managed to escape the building. Kadash chased after them and taunted Kyrie with the memories of her real friends, Kadaj, Laz, and Yazoo. As they ran, he stabbed Evan where he had been shot with a blade he formed from nothing. Rude and Reno were headed to the inn along with Leslie and their chopper and managed to spot them with Song and Alina. Song had ordered Reno to shoot, but with Evan in the way, his conscience wouldn't let him. After seeing another helicopter, Kadaj leaped to attack the Turks. While Evan and Kyrie ran, they found a narrow opening leading underground and fell. As they did, the sensation they felt had changed into a calm presence, as they found themselves in a world made of white. Evan's shoulder healed, and he realized that they had fallen into the life stream. Moments later, they were taken out of it and were underneath the surface of the planet. Above ground, Reno, Rude, and Leslie jumped out of their helicopter during their fight as Tsung fired a rocket at it with Kadaj inside, but saw no trace of him after. While Evan and Carrie searched for a way out, they saw dozens of corpses. While most of them wore black robes, one of them caught their eye. As he examined it, Evan realized he was staring at his mother holding on to two letters explaining her disappearance. When Evan was a young boy, he needed surgery for his heart, and she did what she could to pay for it. However, the doctor told her that he would need another surgery once he grew up, or he'd die. In an effort to make money to cover it, she returned to Shinra and was assigned to look after the experimented people in black robes in Nibelheim. Once they started walking north, she followed them, only to end up falling down the chasm. After hugging his mother and realizing that she never abandoned him, Evan noticed that she had been holding something else under a jacket. As he pulled it out, he recognized it immediately as the arm from the picture. The arm of Genova. Kadaj appeared to try to kill them both, but once he saw the arm, his expression changed. After running away, Evan dropped the arm into the floor of the live stream by accident, and Kadash chased after it. As he reached into the live stream, it began to move on its own to bring him in, dissolving his body. He screamed for his mother, but as his body was enveloped in the light, he promised to come back. In the aftermath, Evan and Carrie were rescued by the Turks and managed to find the doctor who had done his surgery in the past. As luck would have it, it was the same doctor from Laura Junon, however, he refused to perform the surgery. He explained that in the years prior, while money was tough, he would regularly tell the parents of the children he operated on that they would need to come back for one reason or another. Everything that Annette Townshend had done to save Evan's life was all built upon this single lie. Song didn't take kindly to the news and left the doctor in a condition that required his own surgery. When returning to Midgar, Leslie and Merle kept Evan's house, as Evan and Carrie moved into Fabio's old place to take care of his younger brother. After a while, the monument in the center of the city was finished, and Evan's client reunited with his son. As the city of Edge continued to grow, the Turks continued their search for Genova. After some time, they managed to locate her missing head in a northern cave. While they went down to retrieve it, however, Tsung and Elena were captured after giving Reno time to escape. After hearing about what happened, Rufus knew he would need help against this new threat. He had Reno call Seventh Heaven and hoped to ask Cloud for help. Tifa passed a message to him over his voicemail, as Cloud laid the buster to sword at Zack's final resting place. On the hill overlooking Midgar, Cloud still struggled with his memories. He continued to withdraw himself from everyone out of both fear and guilt. 
As he rode off on his motorcycle, Fenrir, three silver-head men kicked off the sword. Kedaj, Laz, and Yezu, the three remnants of Sephiroth, followed Cloud in hopes that he knew what Genova was. As Laz and Yezu questioned him, Cloud could feel Sephiroth's presence from them. Kadaj instead chose to set up a meeting with Rufus, as he knew he'd be the one in charge of hiding Genova's head. After their conversation, Kadaj called off his brothers and left Cloud in a state of confusion. To find out more, Cloud went to Healin Lodge where he met with Rufus still healing from his injuries, along with Reno and Rude. Rufus asked him for help in dealing with Kadaj's group, and explained that he felt responsible for the state of the world. He had hoped to make sure Sephiroth's return was impossible and rebuild the world, as well as the company. Cloud refused, both because of his own shaken confidence that he could protect anyone and because of his distrust in his old employers. After he left to fix the Buster Sword at Zack's grave, Kadaj arrived to threaten Rufus and showed him Song and Alina's ID cards to show he was serious. He explained Geostigma was their doing, their mother and Sephiroth's imprint on the world. With Genova's head, they could finish their reunion and take the planet for themselves. At the same time, Tifa and Marlene were tending to the flowers in Eris's church and found Cloud's secret, the black-stained bandages of his geostigma. Unfortunately, Laws arrived shortly after, still looking for Mother and fought with Tifa. Before killing her, however, Marlene caught his attention with their chest full of materia. By the time Cloud had returned to the church, Laws took the chest along with Marlene. When checking on Tifa, he too fell unconscious from his geostigma and entered the world of pure white laying next to her. As they lay there, Yezu went to the city of Edge and picked up several of the diseased orphans in promises of healing them, including Denzel. Cloud and Tifa woke up back in Seventh Heaven after being carried by Reno and Rude. They told them about the missing kids and left them alone to find where they had been taken. While Cloud explained his feelings for her, Tifa urged him that they could get through anything together. Before they could finish, Reno and Rude arrived and told them they found the missing children in the city of Ancients, the forgotten capital. There, the three men equipped themselves with the material they took and turned the water into a dark color, infecting it with Genova's black livestream, the negative livestream. They explained that the water would cure them, and after the kids drank from the water, the brothers could take control of all of them. As Cloud drove to them, he found himself in a world of pure white again, this time with Aerith. She was happy that he decided to still fight, but asked what drove him to do so. He explained that he wanted to be forgiven, but Aerith told him she never blamed him to begin with. As he exited the world of white, the three brothers attacked him. Cloud managed to see the kids brainwashed and tried to save Marlene, but was pinned down by Kadaj. Before Kadaj could do any more damage, Vincent saved Cloud and disappeared into the trees. Discouraged, Cloud asked him what he knew. Vincent told him everything he learned from Song and Alina, who he'd also rescued after they were taken. Not knowing that the three brothers were after Genova's head, they wondered what the brothers really were. Marlene arrived and surprised both of them, and after some self-reflection, Cloud took her and drove back to Edge. There, Laws and Yuzu arranged the kids as hostages and summoned monsters around the monument in the center of the city. They determined that because Shinra built it, Genova's head would have to be there. At the same time, Kadaj met with Rufus to oversee the event and explained to him their real plan, to bring back Sephiroth. To prove he was serious, he summoned Bahamut to destroy the monument and anything else in its way. The rest of the party showed up with the help of Sid's new airship and managed to rescue the kids and fight the monsters with the Turks. Once Cloud arrived, they all helped propel him upward as Bahamut prepared his attack. As he made his way up to stop it, Rufus took off his robe in front of Kadaj and revealed that he had Genova's head the entire time. Kadaj attacked him and knocked Rufus off the building as Cloud defeated Bahamut. The Turks saved Rufus before falling to his death, but Kadaj finally got what he wanted. Cloud managed to see what had happened and chased after them. Rude and Reno set up a bomb to deal with Laz and Yezu, as Cloud caught up to Kadaj at the church. There, Kadaj destroyed the flower bed and revealed a pool of water underneath. As it sprang to life, it showered over Cloud and healed his geostigma as Kadaj recoiled and drove away from it. Once Cloud caught up, they fought until Kadaj murdered Genova's head and Sephiroth took control. As Sephiroth resurrected, he told Cloud everything. Using Geostigma, he planned to grow his control and influence until he could take over the planet and use it as a vessel to travel across the universe to find more to infect. As the two fought, Sephiroth sent his black livestream to start attacking the planet, but Eris's white livestream began to fight back. In between sword clashes, Sephiroth sprouted a single black wing and asked Cloud what he values most so he could have the pleasure of taking it away. Before he could answer, Cloud found himself in the same world as before, this time with Zack. After reminding him of their oath and to continue living for both of them, Cloud left the world of white with more determination than ever. 
With the thoughts of everyone in his life, Cloud attacked Sephiroth and told him that there wasn't a thing he didn't cherish in his life. As Sephiroth admitted defeat, Aerith cast a healing rain on a city. Cloud looked to Sephiroth and told him to stay in his memories, but as Sephiroth relinquished control of Kadaj, he smiled and said, I will never be a memory. Kadash tried to continue fighting, but found himself falling into Cloud's arms as Aerith reached her hand out to take him into the livestream. As his friends watched from Sid's airship, however, Yazu shot Cloud in the back. Both he and Laws approached with barely any life left, and blew both themselves and Cloud up. As Cloud was knocked unconscious, he found himself in the world of white again, but Aerith and Zack told him it wasn't his time to stay there just yet. While he was knocked out, word about the healing water spread, and everyone afflicted with geostigma ran to the church. By the time Cloud woke up, he found himself floating in the water with his friends watching. Denzel arrived with them and joined Cloud in the pool, where Cloud poured water over him. As he healed, Cloud looked on to see Aerith and Zack leaving together in the livestream, finally able to let go of them. In the next few days, Evan arrived with Fitz, Fabio's younger brother, to heal him as well. After meeting with Cloud and Tifa again, they told him they had a lot to catch up on. While the threat of Sephiroth seemed to have been stopped, the story continued, but to explain it, we'll have to backtrack a little. Before the war with Wutai, Deep Ground produced a number of genetically altered super soldiers using Genesis's genes. They would establish a ranking system for them to climb, with the highest being a Sviet, where they could have a color granted to their title if they were deemed dangerous enough. The first of the Deep Ground soldiers was named Rosso, whose mind was broken during the experimentation and became obsessed with bathing in her victim's blood. Once Grimoire found a tainted livestream, it was used in other experiments, but only one child named Nero survived. He was able to control the darkness that came from his body. The first victim of that darkness was his own mother, who disappeared into it without a trace, and forced the researchers to keep him in a special suit. The testing of the Deep Ground soldiers had all been done using G cells except for one, Nero's older brother, Vice. Even without Genova's cells, Vice had proven to be the strongest of the other experiments and had only consumed pure Mako. As a result, they referred to him as Vice the Immaculate, and he, Rosso, and Nero became colored Sviets. Because of the Deep Ground Soldiers' dependency on Mako, they were all outfitted with suits that continuously fueled them with it. They would fight each other for the sake of research using virtual reality, but this often would result in their death. A group of four managed to prove themselves as the best of the Deep Ground Soldiers and became known as the Lost Force. They became feared and respected by the others in the facility, but one day during the Wutai War, they were discovered by another soldier group. This outside group tried to destroy the facility as they thought it was completely unethical, but the Lost Force killed them all. Seeing how loyal they were, the President gave them a new role and changed Deep Ground forever. Chips were installed into every other soldier in the facility that could be controlled by Lost Force. With this change, they became known as the Restrictors and the chips were tied to the facility's computer mainframe called Patricia. As more soldiers were brought in, the dynamics started to shift in the facility. A woman named Argento in particular had risen through the ranks quickly until she was challenged to a duel with one of the restrictors and lost an eye during the fight. She eventually was given the role of overseeing new recruits and scouting out the strongest of them, becoming a maternal figure to them. She would design weapons for them as well, but grew to hate the restrictors over time. As the colored Zviets became more powerful, a plan was put into place to make sure they couldn't escape. Rosso and Nero were kept in a separate part of Deep Ground, while Vice was taken to the core of Mako Reactor Zero, where he was restrained to a throne. Locking him up and drugging him wasn't seen as enough, however, so they injected him with a special chip tied to Patricia. If the computer couldn't detect the restrictors alive, a virus would be injected to kill him within three days. This gave him the new nickname of the Immaculate Emperor. The only time he was released was when he was sent on missions, or when other soldiers reached the rank of Sviet. Those recruits could then challenge Vice to a duel under the supervision of a restrictor. Eventually, a young girl named Shelk Rui would be taken to Deep Ground, who possessed an ability called Synaptic Net Diving that allowed her to access computer programs as well as other people's consciousness and memories. After the Turks recruited Azul to the soldier program, he ended up in Deep Ground too. He took part in a shape-shifting experiment and killed every other participant in his newly discovered behemoth form. Once he and Shelk rose through the ranks, they became members of the Colored Zviets as well. With the rising cruelty of the restrictors, Vice started to come up with a plan to deal with them and escape. With Argento being able to freely go where she pleased, she became the only means of communication between the five colored Zviets. When Vice and Nero picked up Genesis, Vice even asked him to join them. Genesis decided against it, however, and sealed himself in a cavern under the city. Before long, the colored Zviets found their way around the chips but would need a new recruit to enact their plan. 
Vice had Shelkin Argento use something called the virus that forced Patricia to implant a faulty chip into a recruit they thought could become strong enough to kill a restrictor. After looking for a while, they found one that shared the same hatred towards the restrictors as them. One whose mind wasn't warped like the others, and was burdened by the memories of when their sister was killed. When they arrived, they met with another soldier named Usher, who became their guide in a cruel world of deep ground. After rising through the ranks and earning the title of general, the new recruit joined the Restrictor on the mission to escort Shelk to the mainframe. Once there, the Restrictor ordered Shelk to kill them, but she managed to trick them and spare the recruit's life. After reaching Sviet rank, the new recruit was given the chance to duel with Vice, but lost. The Restrictor instead granted Vice's wish of fighting against his fellow colored Sviets to test his strength. While they fought, Shelk helped the new recruit to remember that their sister's murderer was the same Restrictor in front of them. With this newfound hatred, they attacked the Restrictor. Vice managed to distract them by trying to attack too, and gave the new recruit enough time to shoot them. The Restrictor stabbed the new recruit in retaliation, but this gave Vice enough time to kill them. And with that, the mission was a success, and the other Zviats planned to recreate it until all the Restrictors were killed. As the new recruit lay dying, Shug decided to tell them the truth about their plan. Not only had Usher been an illusion the entire time, but all of their memories of their sister were implanted by Shulk at the start. As their puppet died, the colored Zviats moved on to the next one. The cycle would continue until all the restrictors were dead, but before they were set free, Deep Grand had been sealed up. When Meteor was descending, Mako Reactor Zero automatically locked up as a precaution, and everyone inside had been trapped. After things quieted down from Sephiroth's near return, Geostigma was still very present on the planet. The cure for it still remained at Eris' church, but many people had the disease without even knowing it. It was dormant for many people, and for others, the trip to Midgar was too far. Reeve used the WRO to help where he could, and started to take an interest in uncovering Shinra's old secrets. Vincent, in between his time searching for information of his own, returned to where he found Lucrezia. Inside the cave, he saw that she had been encased in a crystal and would sit to talk with her periodically. Later, Reeve called Vincent to calm one day during their yearly festival of having survived Meteor, but the event was abruptly interrupted. Deep Grand soldiers, having been freed from their prison, dropped their soldiers from the helicopters and started scanning the crowds. They opened fire, killing dozens of people and placed the remaining people in containers. Vincent helped save who he could, but the Deep Grand soldiers seemed to be aware of him. Azul and Shelk eventually confronted him and introduced themselves before asking for the location of the Protomateria, but as Shelk began to pass out, they ended up retreating. Together with Reeve and the WRO troops, Vincent fought off the remaining soldiers but heard more reports of them appearing in Edge. On their way there, Reeve explained what he knew about Deep Ground from Shinra's archives and about a bizarre phenomenon that happened in Junon. 1,200 people had seemingly vanished from the city without a trace, and the only lead they had came from rumors in Edge, where the people could hear the wails of hundreds coming from Midgar. As they listened for the sounds, Vice broadcast himself onto every screen he could and announced Deep Ground's plan for the planet to everyone listening, to cleanse the planet of all those they deemed to be tainted. Once the broadcast ended, monsters attacked and disabled their truck, the Shadow Fox. While Reeve stayed behind to fix it and get back to the WROHQ, he had Vincent continue going to Edge to help his troops there. There, he bumped into Shalua Rui, now working with the WRO, in a seemingly deserted part of Edge. While 500 people were supposed to be roaming the city and the WRO accompanying them, everything was eerily quiet. They both sensed something was wrong, but Shalua had been searching for something else that she described as her reason to live, and went off on her own. Vincent eventually found his way to the warehouse after being tipped off by a dying WRO member and an abandoned child, where he met Rosso the Crimson. Like Azul and Shelk, she asked Vincent for the Protomateria, describing it as their means of controlling Omega. Vincent had no idea what she was talking about, but Rosso took his silence as stubbornness and attacked him. As they fought, he transformed his body as he had many times before, but found himself exhausted after exerting so much power. After Rosso was blown back by it and forced to retreat, Vincent collapsed. Luckily, Shalua rescued him and took him to the WRO headquarters, where they both had questions for each other. She was shocked to hear that Vincent called his transformation chaos, something she knew from Lucrezia's work. Vincent hadn't been aware of her involvement in the creature inside him, and after the briefing with Reeve, they realized it was all connected. As they figured out that learning more of Lucrezia's work on Omega and Chaos could be beneficial to them, Deep Grand invaded their base. While Vincent and Reeve went to fend them off, Shalua managed to catch a glimpse of Shelk through the surveillance system and rushed to see her. After seeing that Shelk had been following Vincent, she caught up to the two and confronted the sister she had been searching for 10 years. 
Their reunion was short-lived, however, as Shaw continued to try and kill anything that stood in her way. After retreating for a short while, Vincent returned to incapacitate Shelk and was later forced to defend himself against Azul too. After killing Azul, the WRO kept him in the morgue while Shalua kept Shelk in her lab. With the immediate threat of deep ground dealt with, Vincent and Reeve decided to investigate elsewhere. Vincent decided to get back to Nibelheim to find Lucrezia's work inside Shinra Manor, but monsters destroyed his helicopter transport, so he had to take a boat to Junon to get to Costa del Sol and wait for a new one. The city had mostly been abandoned, but Deep Ground followed up to kill the remaining tainted citizens they left behind, confirming that they had been the ones behind the disappearances. Rosso eventually found and fought Vincent again, until he got away in the ship, but instead of following, Nero decided to fight him himself. The passengers were forced to run from Sahagin that made their way on board, and while Vincent secured lifeboats for them, one scientist demanded that she go back for her research. She reminded him of Lucrezia and remembered distracting her from her work before escorting her to it. After escorting her to a lifeboat, Vincent wondered just what research Lucrezia was hiding at the manor until Nero released a robot to attack him. Once he destroyed it, the boat sank and Vincent was left alone at the sea. Luckily, he was rescued by Katesith and his submarine. Nero looked on at them leaving for Nibelheim and noted how similar he was to Vincent, but felt a disturbance. As he rushed back to Midgar, Reef controlled the second Katesith to find out what Deep Ground was up to. After the cat infiltrated the headquarters inside Mako Reactor Zero, he found the large containers full of people being flung into a large pool of Mako, with a hand springing out from inside to drag them all in. Before exploring any further, Nero appeared behind him to explain that what he saw was Omega and absorbed him into darkness. After Vincent reached Shinra Manor, he found a projection that Lucrezia left for him that explained Omega's purpose of absorbing the livestream of the planet. As he searched through the manor, he found the very chamber that he had been placed in years before and started to recall his last time there. Once he snapped out of it, Rosso approached him and explained that even if it meant the death of the planet, Deep Ground would always be loyal to Vice and lure them away. In his pursuit of her, he was interrupted by robots, but as he was distracted with them, she reappeared and ripped the proto-materia from his chest. Unaware of the fact that he even had it to begin with, Vincent transformed into chaos but was unable to control the form without it. Before Rosso had a chance to kill him, Yuffie managed to distract her long enough to rescue him. Once he woke up, they called Reef to find out what he learned before heading back to the WROHQ. While they traveled back, Azul revived and woke up the same time Shalk did, signaling Deep Ground to storm through again. Once Vincent arrived, Azul transformed into a behemoth and threw both him and Shalua aside before aiming for Shalk. She managed to reverse his transformation, but Azul continued to attack her. Shalk had uploaded Lucrezia's data into a neural network to locate the protomateria, but with her mission complete, Deep Ground needed to make sure that WRO couldn't access it from her. She managed to immobilize him for a short time, but as Vincent and Shalua ran to escape, Shalua was forced to stay behind to save her sister. Once Deep Ground retreated, the WRO placed her in a tank to keep her alive, but found that she had suffered too much head trauma to wake up. Confused by why she would go so far to save her, Shalk asked Vincent if he understood, but as the two talked, they both had a flashback of his time with Lucrezia. After speaking with Reeve and seeing that the data Vincent retrieved was incomplete, Shalk offered to help them. Once she accessed Lucrezia's data, she found that the doctor's consciousness would take control of her. By uploading the data to the WRO, she hoped to help them understand Deep Ground's plan and regain full control of herself. As they readied themselves to attack Deep Ground, Reeve called in Cloud, Tifa, Barrett, and Sid to help. After Sid arrived in his airship, Shulk managed to piece together Lucrezia's findings along with Kate's data and showed them all what Omega's function was. Because the weapon's awakening would only be triggered once the planet thought it was in danger, Deep Ground planned to put all the Mako they collected from people in the reactors to trick it. With their new knowledge, they put together a plan to attack from the air and the ground to destroy the other reactors to slow down Omega's awakening and have Vincent deal with the Tviets. During the preparation, Vincent could feel himself lose control over chaos and only managed to regain control after seeing an illusion of Lucrezia. When meeting with Shulk and Reeve, she established that she could help guide him remotely, but made sure to tell him that it was for her own benefit. Once the battle began, a hail of missiles and gunfire erupted from both sides. Rosso focused on fighting Cloud, while Azul nearly shot down the airship. After narrowly escaping the explosion, Vincent ended up in a train graveyard of Sector 7. As he made his way through the Undercity to get to the Shinra building, rescuing WRO troops along the way, he found Rosso waiting for him. Despite not having full control of Chaos, Vincent still defeated her, but rather than let herself die by his hands, Rosso let herself fall off the building. By the time Vincent had made it to the surface, Shell called to tell him that the WRO failed in their mission to destroy the reactors. 
Before stepping into the Shinra building, however, he began to lose control of himself again. As he heard Shulk's voice trying to calm him down, Lucrezia appeared and took over her body to tell him to keep fighting. Before she could say more, however, the airship's engine began to fail with the alarms and snapped Shulk out of her trance. Upon investigating, she found that Nero had killed the crew on board before getting absorbed herself. Without Shulk to guide him to the secret entrance to Mako Reactor Zero, Vincent had no way of progressing. Luckily, Tifa, Cloud, and Barrett happened to call him to tell him that while they all lost communication with the airship, they did have a map of the building. Once he reached the entrance to the reactor, he found Azul waiting for him, transforming into his behemoth form to fight. Azul persisted even after getting knocked down, but Vincent transformed into chaos and killed him. Nero watched as Vincent was unable to return to normal and tossed down Shulk's phone where he could hear Lucrezia's voice coming from. After listening to her, Vincent began to have a vision of when she tried to save his life. Once the vision faded, he returned to normal and entered deep ground. After venturing further in, Nero tried to absorb him into his darkness, but as Vincent sank into nothingness, he heard Shulk from inside. With Nero's abilities coming from the same tainted livestream that Chaos had come from, she explained that Vincent could escape from its effects. Shulk had managed to stay alive using a slowly depleting shield, but while inside, she started to receive Lucrezia's memory of when Grimoire Valentina died and tried to comfort her with the same words she remembered her sister telling her as a child. Suddenly, she found herself with Shulua, who told her that she'd be returning to the planet and that they'd see each other again. Outside, Vincent continued forward, but Nero was determined to protect his brother. While Vincent overpowered him at first, Nero tried to absorb him yet again. Instead, Vincent found Shulk inside and escaped the darkness with her. Yuffie managed to track them down and tried entering the fray, but Nero quickly ignored her and went to join Vice instead. With Shulk injured, Yuffie and Vincent helped place her into a pod so she could absorb Mako again. They then split up so that Yuffie could find a way to shut down the reactor, while Vincent went to find Vice and Nero. After a philosophical talk with Shelk, with both her and Vincent unsure of why they fight but feel compelled to do so anyway, he made his way to the reactor. Vincent had a few obstacles in his way, but by the time he made it through, Yuffie shut down the reactor and met him at the entrance. Inside, they found Vice dead on his throne, with Nero reassuringly claiming that his brother would live again once he infused him with Omega, the same way Vincent was infused with Chaos and that it had been years since he was told about the secret of Rebirth. As Omega began to awaken, Nero absorbed Yuffie into his darkness and forced Vincent to rescue her. After they escaped, Nero caught up to take Vincent away and took control of a spider robot, only to be defeated and limp his way back to his awakened brother. Vice stood up to greet him, but their reunion was short-lived. As they reunited, Vice plunged his hand through his brother's chest and declared that his use was over as Vincent caught up. As he laughed at his victory, Vice greeted Vincent as though they had met before and explained who he truly was. Before a meteor fall, Professor Hojo had uploaded his mind's data into the network, and after seeing Vincent's chaos transformation in person, he realized Lucrezia's research was right. He came up with a plan to obtain Omega's power for himself, but needed a host, and thought Deep Ground would have the perfect host for it. After Vice's death from the virus, Hojo used Nero to enforce his plan, promising to revive his brother, but only took control of Vice's body. Under Hojo's direction, they searched for victims free of geostigma to give birth to the weapon. Vincent immediately tried to stop the Hojo-controlled Vice, but was unable to stop him from absorbing some of Omega's power. Vincent began to lose control. Shulk and Lucrezia tried to help, and Vincent used the proto-material within Vice to use Chaos's power while still retaining his human form. To Hojo's shock, he was able to defeat him, and Nero showed that his darkness remained attached to his brother's body, ruining the pure host Hojo wanted. As he exited Vice's body, Nero managed to free him from Hojo's control and asked to merge with him completely to join him. After merging, Vice walked towards the pool of Mako and disappeared, dropping the proto-material into the stream. Yuffie rushed over to see what was going on. At the same time, the Mako started to react violently and shoot out. Vincent pushed her out of the way, but got caught in the sudden burst of the live stream from the reactors, forming Omega above Midgar. Vincent transformed into chaos and exploded from its head to escape, but the weapon reformed again with a barrier that prevented him from attacking it. Seeing this, Shulk jumped into action and used her SND ability to remotely dive into Omega as the darkness within the live stream tried to restrain her. Before she was completely immobilized, Lucrezia's spirits appeared to save her, and together they shot through Omega and placed the proto-materia back into Vincent's chest. As he saw Shulk as Lucrezia, she was pulled back into the live stream and he saw into memories again and started to understand her motivations. The two were able to connect to each other with Shulk's help, and Lucrezia apologized to Vincent for the mistakes she made. Once he exited the vision, Vincent left to go get Shulk to take her back to the surface. 
As he left to try to break through Omega's barrier, the weapon strengthened it by absorbing more Mako from the reactors. To weaken it, Cloud, Tifa, Barrett, Sid, Reeve, and the remaining WRO troops blew up the other reactors. After getting through the barrier, Vincent managed to find a way inside the weapon using the Proto-Materia, where he found a cocoon containing vice underneath the water. Once it emerged, it began to absorb the lifestream of the planet until Vincent destroyed it, only for Vice to be released to attack him. They continued to trade blow after blow until Vice joined with a smaller version of Omega to increase its strength. Once Vincent defeated him, however, Omega used the lifestream it absorbed to sprout wings and begin to take off into space. He chased it into the atmosphere before it could leave the planet and charged headfirst into it, destroying it and releasing the lifestream into the air. As the livestream returned to the planet, it showered over the remaining survivors, including Shalua in her capsule. In the weeks after, Shell began to heal while everyone else searched for Vincent. Following her hunch, she waited for him outside of the Crystal Cave, where Vincent thanked Lucrezia for helping him defeat Omega. As he left, she shed a single tear, and Vincent rejoined Shelk, where the two looked up at the sky where they could see the remains of Omega. The planet was saved once again, but there was still one other loose end. Vice's body had ended up underneath Midgar, where Genesis finally left his water chamber and flew away with him. While this aspect of the story has no revelation, we do know the fate of the planet years beyond most of these characters' lives. Nearly 500 years in the future, Nanaki's dream comes to fruition as he and his children venture to a Midgar covered in greenery. As he overlooks the city and sees the smoke coming from the people living in it, he looks to the sky and howls. The planet's future seemed to be secure, and for many years, that was all there was of the Final Fantasy compilation. That is, until the most recent soon-to-be trilogy of games. I hope this gives some of you out there a better understanding of Seven's expensive story, and helps make better sense of all the references present in these new games. I love a lot of these characters, and the moments spent with them, but I didn't fully latch on until I saw how much they'd all gone through. My name is Yorcia, and while the focus of this channel is to tell these entire storylines, over on mine, I want to focus on what these games make you feel. Hironobu Sakaguchi, the creator of Final Fantasy, wanted Final Fantasy VII to show that death didn't mean gone, but to also illustrate the effect that loss had on the characters. He started working on the game after his mother had passed away while making Final Fantasy III, and crafted this beautiful story during his grieving. You don't have to love everything in the compilation, but it's hard to deny how much passion was put into the start of it. Thank you for watching.